bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. What up, what up, what up, what up? How you doing? How are you? Doing. It's Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Tuesday, March 15th. 74 days of the new year, 290 days left. We are live from a bunker deep underground in downtown Burbank, California. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. It's Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet, I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Yeah. All right. Getting settled in here. Tonight. Tonight, we have a very special guest back with us. Dr. Carmen Bolter is here. We're going to talk about the current state of the Egyptian imaging that's going on over in Giza, Valley of the Kings, and her new documentary, which is called The New Atlantis. It's going to be a great night tonight. The New Atlantis. And tomorrow evening, Jonathan Young joins the show curator of the Joseph Campbell archives and uh he's a mythologist not a mixologist but he probably does that too but but a mythologist folklore history yeah the hero's tale tomorrow night Jonathan Young right here the call in number for tonight's show is 323-825-5045 I tweeted out right before the show uh, you've got to check out the new Gangsta, OG Gangsta website of ours. It is dialed in and getting more dialed every day. But now I think we're at the point where we can go, all right, yeah, that that's good. <laughs> that's functional. That looks great. I'm proud, and we are. Check out the website. It is it is all that. Seriously. I almost said and a bag of chips, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, man. And what's really cool, I think that everything is there on the homepage. Then we have all of the other content that you need for the website, you know, past guests and uh, a place to shop. And we have fade to blog and, and lots of stuff to read and you can go hang out with all the fader knots, and I think we've got all of that stuff dialed. Uh, the contact page is now easier and simpler. Um, so, you know, that's for the yahoos to email us, you know. Uh, very rarely does somebody use that, you know, to send a nice email. You know, hey, man, you really enjoy the show. Now, people don't take the time to do that. <laughs> they use that page to run anonymous. <coughs> all right. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Life Change T, for, for doing what you do 
and having Ronnie on the show this week, I thought was really great. And the special that they have right now, it is cold and flu season. So right now, if you order two months of the Super Strength Tea, you get the Moringa for just five bucks and free shipping. You can go there right now. Click on the banner, StreamingChurchRadio.com, uh, just to go directly to get the tea.com. Life Change Tea. Just mention Jimmy when you order, either on the phone or online, and get yourself that free shipping, and that Fader Non Special is right there for you. All right? Now, also, now, finally, uh, and it, it took a while to get here, but uh, on the homepage now, all of the information is there for all of the upcoming events. Everything is there on the homepage. You can see, you can go to Future, and you can do this, and you can navigate through the site. You can do what you want. But uh, right there on the homepage now, everything is there. So... All the information you need for the New Living Expo, which is April 29th through May 1st in San Mateo, California. Everything is right there. Okay. Um, Stephen Greer, Nassim Haramain, Greg Braden, Scott Walter, many others. Uh, Mike Barra is going to be there. Uh, Laura Eisenhower. All the information is there for the New Living Expo. And we look forward to seeing all of the Fader Knots up there in San Mateo. So. Everything is there. You can go and just click through it. Contact in the desert, the Roswell Festival, UFOs within reach. It's all right there. Okay, we've got a very busy summer coming up, and we're going to go and hang out with all of you Fader Knots all around the country. So let's do this. It's going to be great. Info is there. Uh, really, really looking forward to the summer that lies in front of all of us. And we are uh, always looking for really good writers for Fade to Blog. If you think you've got what it takes and you want to come write for us, just email Rita, Rita at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can also reach her directly on the contact page and uh, send us your stuff. We'll check it out. And if you, if you are interested in writing for us, Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Look how we have this laid out for you. And look how you can be represented. And we have heavy, heavy traffic on that website every single day. It is a ranked website. It is it is right there. So if you want to be represented and you want people to read what you've got, you can go and start your own blog and have 10 people a day. How would you like to have 10,000 a day, right? Think about that. All right. Very simple. Fade to blog, Rita at Jimmy Church Radio.com. With that, let's get this show cracking. Today, the man, D. Snyder, is 61 years old. Yeah, man. And I said it. 61 still looks pretty good, doesn't he? Kind of looks the same. He looked 61 in 1981. But that's a whole nother story. D U Rock, my brother. Still one of the great Christmas albums in the history of everything. Brett Michaels today is fifty three. Happy birthday, Brett. I've known Brett for thirty two years. Long time. Happy birthday, Brett. And uh, today man, I feel like I'm name dropping. I don't mean to really, but Fabio today is fifty seven. Lincoln Park DJ Joe Hahn, Joe Hahn is 39. He went to, uh, you know, he went to uh, uh, Art Center and uh, college in, in Pasadena. And I think that's pretty much where Lincoln Park, you know, got together. And then nobody graduated college because uh, they all goofed off and, and, and put a little band together that didn't really go anywhere, right? Yeah, 100 million albums. Will I Am... Today is 41. And, uh, oh, I wanted to go back to Fabio. I'm, I'm going to tell a Fabio story. I'm going to admit this right now. Everybody knows I used to work at Guitar Center, right, in Hollywood. And I uh, I used to manage pro audio downstairs. Great gig, great people. Had, had, had a really good time there for a long time. And um, I'm walking through, and, and it's empty. And uh, I'm walking through, and there's somebody standing down there. And I I walk up and I'm like, uh, can I help you? Dude turns around and it's Fabio, right? <laughs> and I go, hey, you're Fabio. And he goes, I am. I am Fabio. I'm Fabio. I was like, no way. So we go, and this is this is the only part of the story that's hysterical. We go into my office. We're sitting down, and he wants to build a studio in his house, which we eventually did. Actually. 
with uh, James Fox from Studio Dome, right? Studio Dome, the speaker company. Um, uh, we put the studio in his house. It was really cool. Anyway, so we're sitting in my office, and I go, Fabio, what's your real name? My name is Fabio. I go, okay, let me see your driver's license. Whips out his driver's license. Fabio. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Hands me a couple of credit cards. Fabio. No last name. Fabio. Dude is really Fabio. I'm Fabio. And he turned out to be, I'm going to say this right now, one of the coolest dudes on planet Earth. That dude is badass. Fabio, happy birthday. Happy birthday. I, I can get Fabio on this show, I think. I think I could probably pull that off. Our dead guy's birthday today is St. Nicholas. That's right. 270 to 343. Died at the age of 73. And he's remembered for his role in bringing out apparent miracles and for his frequent secret gifts. Yes, because he is the original OG Santa Claus. The Santa Claus. And he's also the patron, patron saint of children, students, brewery and pawn shop owners, and thieves who regret their crimes. Happy birthday, St. Nick. Sometimes you just can't make this stuff up. I don't know who vets this stuff, but uh, there you go. Happy birthday, St. Nick. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio, Facebook, YouTube. When you go over to the website, I think everything is there now, right? Okay, I think it is. Oh, I don't have it up. Otherwise, I would check. But you can follow, like, and subscribe right there on our homepage. You can also email throughout the show. I get to as many as I can. You can email me directly, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. But it's not so direct. It's not. I don't get it. But if it's good, it gets in here to me. All right? Do it. The sandbox is hashtag F2B. We do not bite. Tonight, very special guest Carmen Bolter is with us. We're going to talk about what is going on over in Egypt right now with the imaging King Tut's tomb, also uh, the Great Pyramid, and her new documentary, which is called The New Atlantis. And, of course, uh, she, she did one of the best, the best documentary series in the history of Egypt. And we'll talk about that, too, as well. Tomorrow night, Jonathan Young joins the show. He is the curator, of course, of the Joseph Campbell Archives. On this day in history, in 44 B.C., the Ides of March, Julius Caesar, dictator for life of the Roman Empire, is murdered by his own senators at a meeting hall next to Pompey's Theater. The conspiracy against Caesar encompassed as many as 60 noblemen, including Caesar's own protege, Marcus Brutus. Fader fact. Around 1 in 10 convicts in Finland escaped prison in 2013, making it the prison break capital of Europe. And that is a fader fact. Now, someone said last night on Twitter, man, you know, man, I'm just, I'm a little pissed off right now. Hold on. I, I got to do this. I got to calm down. Somebody said last night on Twitter that this show was becoming too right wing. And although I can appreciate the thought, I really can. I can, I can see that because I avoid politics like the plague, even privately, privately. I don't talk politics. I don't like to do it. I don't like to see people get upset. And right now they do. You can't win today in a political discussion. You can't even talk. You can't, you can't do anything. You can't mention it. You can't. But this show isn't right wing or left wing. If anything, says on, if anything, I'm a buffalo hot wing with blue cheese dipping sauce. Mmm, tasty. That's what I am. 
Seriously. I understand why the Twitter-er would make the comment. If you tune into this show once in a while and you don't do it often and, you know, once in a while you bang in here and you do a drive-by, you're probably going to catch our normal vibe like tonight's show. Egypt, Gobekli Tepe, the paranormal, UFOs, lost civilizations, a little Bigfoot, maybe some time travel. And like everything today, you'll get a big dose of conspiracy because that is the new normal. But if you miss the occasional show about the conspiracy of politics, the New World Order, the Illuminati, the Bilderbergs, you don't know my take on Washington or who is running the world. And that, my friends, is the biggest conspiracy of them all. So if you have somebody that does a drive-by, like this Twitter-er did, and they hear a heated discussion about politics and the conspiracy about that, suddenly I'm right-wing or I'm left-wing and I'm a political guy. You don't get it. That's not what this show is about. The show is about the conspiracy of everything. And I've said this so many times. So many. All I have to do is think Republican. Think Democrat. Think Obama or anything political. Just think it. And somebody completely freaks out because they don't get it. And they get offended. And I'm not sorry for that. I don't do this show for you. I do this show for me. I'm not here to spread fear. It's not my job. There's plenty of other hosts out there and networks doing a damn fine job of it. That's not my game. Don't care. I'm here to spread the concept of fascination. That's my job. To look at what is going on around us with wonder, with fascination, with wide eyes. But because of this election, our country right now is so far from anything normal. In fact, I'm serious. We've pushed normal off a cliff. It's gone. We are into another zone of reality, a type of reality we know absolutely nothing about, and it's fascinating. And it could turn out to be a good thing. Seriously, let me explain. Stay with me. We, us, the media, you, politicians, everybody that you know. Everyone has pushed this car so far that after today, March 15th, there'll be no turning back. And we can't. Today, today we'll have our own Ides of March. This may turn out to be a day we'll, we'll all remember for quite some time. If this turns out to be the day that the Republican Party crumbles into a mass of burning rubble, so be it. Don't care. After today, does the Democratic Party continue on its path of craziness that was started by Trump's loud mouth and they got all involved and now both sides? I mean, it's, it's insane. It could implode as well. And I don't care. I don't. Does a meteor crash into Washington, D.C., leaving a smoldering heap of what it once was? It very well could. There could be a, just a giant crater of what was our nation's capital. We need to be careful. Now, go with me on this. Just, just go with me. Somebody wants it this way. They want this craziness. 
They want you confused. They they want that. I mean, it, it it is it is being pushed upon us. There is a conspiracy driving all of this. And again, I'm not right wing, left wing, anything wing. I'm fascinated wing because I'm kicking back and observing it, and we all are. It's playing out on television, twenty four hours a day. And who wants it this way? I don't know. But whoever they are, they're scary. The implications are huge. But what they are starting to see is that we are many. They are few. And that's the truth. And that's the bright side in this. Yes, we got complacent. Yes, we got comfortable. Yes, we got fat. We had the blinders on. We did. And we did it for way too long. But now we're waking up. Us, we, you, all of us. We're ready for change. And you can feel it. You can see it. That's why that's why we're a little bit pissed off right now. We're tired of the status quo of Washington politics. We want our country back. That's all. It's not much to ask. That's it. It's just gotten too far out of control. And now we've pushed that car so far. It's like Thelma and Louise, man. It's going over that cliff. Now, in the end, how is this going to play out? I don't know. But sometimes things have to fall down. So you can rebuild what you really wanted in the first place. Now, listen to me. This is for real. This is not playtime. This is the United States. We love our country. We love each other. We don't hate each other. Not in this country. People have died before us to give us what we have today proud people and to see us divide and conquer and hate in the streets right now is stupid we are way way better than that this divide and conquer thing that has been pushed down our throats it ain't gonna happen what we are watching play out is reality tv gone really bad we have to watch how far we're willing to go with all of this. But they will not divide us, and they will not scare us. We're Americans, we're proud, we love each other, and that's it. And that will prevail. And that's why I say this could very well be our very own Ides of March. This time, the conspiracy is real but we caught them on tv we'll see how this plays out after today there's no turning back that's it <laughs> you can't put it in reverse there's no time traveling here let's get to some of the news that you know nothing about crazy story today Dandy, please, Jimmy, please. We hear this all day long on every channel. Let's hear a guest talk about something else. Exactly. Dandy, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. A man charged with fatally shooting six people in southwestern Michigan, interspersed with his stints as an Uber driver, told investigators he was being controlled by the ride hailing app through his cell phone. According to a, re a police report, this was released yesterday, Jason Dalton told authorities after the February 20th shootings at, in and around Kalamazoo that it feels like it's coming from the phone itself and that it was like an artificial presence. He told off of officers that when you plug into the Uber app, you can actually feel the presence on you, end quote. He said the difference between the night of shootings and others was that an icon on the Uber app.
that was normally red had changed to black. When he opened the Uber app, he explained a devil head popped up on his screen. And when he pressed the button on the app, that is when all of the problems started. End quote. That is nuts. <laughs> That's some paranormal stuff for you. Michael Jackson's estate has agreed to sell its remaining stake in the lucrative music catalog to Sony Corp for $750 million. The agreement for Jackson's half share of the Sony ATV music publishing catalog will give the company sole ownership of the works by pretty much everybody, including the Beatles, Bob Dylan, Eminem, and Taylor Swift. The sale does not include rights to Jackson's master recordings or songs that he wrote, and the singer's estate will continue to have a stake in EMI Publishing, Inc. Check this. He bought it for $51 million, sold it for seven fifty. Disney announced today, yes, the fifth Indiana Jones movie starring Harrison Ford will premiere on July 19th. Don't get excited. 2019 Steven Spielberg will return as the film's director. I have to ask you, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to light up Twitter right now. I want to know, don't worry. I'm not going to turn anybody in. All right. Are you a Netflix moocher? You, I'm talking to you. Are you a Netflix moocher? Well, quartz is touting a new survey. That shows 31% <laughs> of the U.S. Netflix users are moochers. They're using someone else's login information instead of paying for the streaming entertainment service themselves. Uh, is anybody here your, uh, uh, is uh, anybody here a Netflix uh <laughs> Netflix uh, moocher. I, I, I was really curious about this. The rationale behind the uh, allowing account sharing is as much about keeping current subscribers as it is snaring new ones down the line. The more people depend on one single account, the less likely the account holder is to abandon the service. That's the logic that Netflix has with this. Netflix is cool with it. They don't want people to get upset and cancel their account. So if you don't live with somebody, you're at somebody else, you're at a different IP address, you do not live with that person and you're sharing that account, Netflix don't care. They just don't want that account closed. Lightman Research Group's last estimate of Netflix moochery was in January 2015, and that was 19% of subscribers sharing password with someone who didn't live with them are you a netflix moocher are you it's okay netflix doesn't care this is fade to black i'm your host timmy church tonight dr carmen bolter is with us we're going to talk egypt and her new documentary the new atlantis i'm your host timmy church email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com follow me on twitter at jchurchradio i'll be back with dr carmen bolter right after this short break stay with us Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, Finney, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. 
It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www nattaxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x e-x-p-e-r-t-s dot com tell them jimmy sent you poor water quality is a major health issue and it's only getting worse municipalities can't keep up standards have dropped and pollutants are increasing where does it all end it ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klitsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. On the Game Changer Network, KGRA The Planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me right now on Twitter, at J Church Radio. You can also follow the good Dr. Carmen Bolter, at Carmen Bolter. Say hello to her. The sandbox is hashtag F2B. Questions for myself. Or uh, Dr. Bolter tonight, use hashtag F2BQ. Of course, email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. All right. Dr. Carmen Bolter is director, producer, and writer of The Pyramid Code, an epic five-episode documentary series that has aired on national TV in 38 countries and is on Netflix in seven countries. Carmen is a retired professor from the Graduate Division of Educational Research at the University of Calgary. She taught in Taiwan for four years, was founder and director of the Women's Therapy and Research Center in Calgary, Canada, and has been involved in all aspects of the vision and development of InteractiveU.com, an online learning and social action network. Dr. Bolter has just published a new edition of her groundbreaking book, Angels and Archetypes, an evolutionary map of feminine consciousness with original sets of angels and archetypes, cards, and runes. Currently, Carmen is working on an exciting new documentary series called The New Atlantis. I can't wait. We're going to discuss that tonight and so much more. Of course, her website is pyramidcode.com. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black our good friend, Dr. Carmen Bolter. Carmen, good evening. Hi, Jimmy. How are you? Since you were on with this last, what have you been up to? Oh, mostly um, production and now in post-production of The New Atlantis. And the focus is going there. And that is an endless checklist, isn't it? It's, it's never-ending. Well, no, it has to end. Um, we're, you know, just squeezing in a few last shoots, but uh, we're in post-production. I'm working with an animation team, and we've got editors, and the final drive of uh, footage has gone to the supervisor of the editors, and so it's all going on. I've got yesterday. I had 14 music tracks 
tracks delivered via FTP and more are on the way. And so it's an original score and all the pieces are falling into place. All the ingredients are there to put it all together. Right on. And when I, what I meant by never ending post-production, you know, you, you go, you shoot, you get everything right. And then, you you know, post-production is that one thing you can fine tune and fine tune and, and, and constantly adjust and everything. And it can be a never ending thing. And at some point, you have to pump the brakes and go, okay, you know what? Let's put a fork in this. It's done. It looks great. Let's go. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The editors were calling the pyramid code the beast by the time we were, <laughs> we were at the tail end. I just wanted it to be done. But, you know, a lot of, you know, producing something that's five hours long also has its, its challenges. And this one will have footage from over 10 countries. So. Now, um, before we move on, there's so much to discuss, and and I do want to talk about the the new Atlantis and the motivation there, and, and we'll get into those details too as well. Um, but I, I, you know, and I've 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 rained down the praises on the Pyramid Code on you so many times, but it is truly one of my favorite things, and I do go back. Once in a while, and I just get my Carmen fix on, you know, and I go back and I'll watch it again and pick out an, uh, you know, uh, an episode and watch it. But it turned it turned you in. It's, it's certainly in our circle of people. It turned you into uh, a reference, a household name. And were you prepared for that kind of situation where now, uh, you know, you're you know, it, I don't want to use famous as the right word. But it, it has been watched by millions of people. Were you prepared for what that brings? No, because an awful lot of people, you know, fired questions off at me, you know, from, you know, just because they're interested in this and that. And so I've received, you know, 15,000 emails from people just asking me a random question. So that was kind of uh, surprising. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you're you're now you're the expert, right? <laughs> Fifteen thousand emails, and, and do you respond to them all? What do you do with that? Well, sometimes I'm slow. I intend to. There's only a couple that I just really didn't know what to say. Maybe five that I didn't answer. I've got a, several in my inbox now, um, and I don't. I have to keep on putting myself in check that I don't owe anybody an explanation because they have a random question for me. A lot of people want me to review their work and look at their theories and that sort of thing and have me document their theories for them. And that's just not how it works. Right. So, um, you know, everybody's an armchair archaeologist, I suppose, who's interested in this material. So, and yeah, I do attempt to answer them all. It's, isn't it interesting how smart people are, too, as well? You know, you start to get these uh, emails in and you just think, man... You know, do, do you have a life? Are, you know, are, you know, are you studying every aspect of everything? It's pretty amazing how smart people are these days. Well, yes and no. I think a lot of people are shut down in terms of their creativity, and uh, I think that school and the news and Hollywood, you know, is, tells us the way things are. And um, you know, most people don't have a clue how to do proper research, and you know, they 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 stand out on stage and say, "I'm right because I said so," and I don't have to prove it. And so, I think that academia has really damaged people in a lot of ways. And so um, I think that there's a real shortage of people understanding how to really go deep into one subject and to really leave no stone unturned. And if you start re re research, whatever you want to research online, you're going to find the exact opposite of, uh, you know, like ads are good for you, no, they're terrible for you, et cetera. You right, know? right, and so, right. You know, so there's contradictions. And I think what we've lost, some of us, some people have lost their moral compass, but I think we've lost our discernment in terms of how to ascertain if something's true, if it's verifiable. So, there's, you know, there's a lot of misinformation. And most people, if they feel good when they read a book or they, they like the results of it, they assume it's true. And there's a lot that's not true. How do you do, that's an interesting uh, way to put it, proper research. How do you do proper research? Okay, well, thanks for asking that. So when I set out to tell a story of the many stories that go within a, a documentary series, I, I think of the notion I've used the word triangulate. So if the, the, the information comes from one place, I won't use it. 
Like it has to have, you know, different disciplines have to point to the same thing. Um, you know, different styles of, of, of research that have gone deep. It needs to come from more than one place. And so various scientists have to be talking about it in order. And, and the other thing is that we have to ascertain, you know, um, you know, who, who got the information? Is it verifiable? Um, can you, you know, can you check the dating lab? You know, is the date real? And so we need to cross correlate things. Now, we do, usually do a literature review. Some people call a literature review research. Well, literature reviews are he said, she said, this guy did this experiment and found this and these are the results. And you're reporting on what other people did. Real research is running a study and and collecting data and you know having some kind of treatment and then measuring with the same instrument again and then um and then coming with with statistical significance but it, the probability that you're looking for is that there's less than one in a thousand chances that it happened by accident that you're really looking at what you've done made an influence that is beyond a reasonable beyond question that it, it couldn't have happened by accident so, and then you go back and you say, okay, this is what we found, and that lines up with what this guy said, but it's slightly different from what this guy said, and then you have to explain it. So that's like a, a research paper, but a, a lot of people um, don't have a clue about how to do that. I have seen uh, different people speak over the years on Giza, right? And mm -hmm. they've never been there. And <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I have issues with that. Now, look, on the, on the same side... I mean, I'm guilty of it. I have my own opinions on Giza. I haven't been there. Um, I think that there's some things really wrong about what we know about Giza, but I, I haven't gotten my shoes dirty. You know what I mean? I haven't been out there. So I'm guilty of it, too. But if you're going to get up and speak on that level as a researcher and have never been to Giza, I tune out. But some people don't, and they listen. And that is what I have an issue with. Well, I just, somebody, lots of people send me their books, and I just read one. Uh, I happened to be speaking at a conference with the fellow, and he's so proud of the fact that he's commenting on Giza, on the pyramids, and he's never been there. But he's got maps, and he's got Abu Sir and Saqqara reversed. He says what the angle of the Great Pyramid is. It's not true. He's talking about what's underneath the sarcophagus. Well, no one's ever been in there. What's inside the passage? Well, no one's been in there. Sorry, right. you don't get to say what the construction is. Right, right. You know? And so, and, and you know, I'm right because I said so, is, is the thesis. And, and I find that quite disturbing. You know what? If I do get to Giza, you and I, we should go together. Let's get in the king's chamber. Let's tip that sarcophagus over. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Let's knock that sucker over. <laughs> oh, but, but yeah, you know, and, and I... Um, a little bit later on in the show, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to run down my Giza checklist uh, to uh, get a chuckle out of you and get your opinions on some of my screwed up views on Giza, and you can set me straight, or you know, or 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 vice versa. Maybe you can maybe you can tell me I'm on the money, but uh, I, I do want to run some of this by you um, now before uh, before we get started on other stuff. Uh, we have two interesting studies that are going on right now in Giza. We have one in the Valley of the Kings at uh, um, uh, King Tut's uh, tomb, uh, looking for possibility uh, the chamber of Nefertiti, which would be interesting and, and certainly pretty dang cool. And then we also have the imaging that is going on at the Great Pyramid. Uh, which one would you like to discuss first? I can go either way. Nefertiti. Okay. What do you think? Well, okay. Now, if th this is my opinion, if that is Nefertiti, would that be the coolest thing maybe like in all of history? Uh, you know, when you think about the significance of King Tut and and the beauty of the artifacts that came out of there, still the most stunning stuff like ever, right? And if we have an undisturbed uh, uh, burial chamber for Nefertiti uh, behind there intact, could that be, like, the coolest thing ever? Well, yeah, but I think it's quite impossible. There's just so much wrong with it all. First of all, I mean, they've been trying, you know, there's a DNA testing that uh, I've been, I was following that for about 15 years of King Tut and how it was interrupted by Zahi on a national security thing, and they had this Japanese team. 
and then you know they had somebody from Brigham Young University, Scott Woodward, and and they they didn't ever got the DNA sample, and then they brought a DNA lab to uh, the basement of the uh, National Museum, and they weren't doing mtDNA, the mitochondrial DNA that would show they were using the Y chromosome. Then you go online before all this, and they're saying, well, here is the 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 mummy of of King T- uh, of Akhenaten, and it was a skeleton in a fetal position, and they're calling it a mummy. Well, and then, you know, then they, they, they wanted Tut to be Akhenaten's son, and one of the reasons is, is that would have made him white instead of black. Well, they, just, they were just bending all the rules, and on, on February 18th, 17th, 2009, I was privileged to be at the press conference when they were announcing that DNA testing, and they, they use a medical model, so they were saying they had a club foot and a hair lip, and he died of malaria. Right. No, none of that can possibly be true. There's so much wrong with the research. Now, there was another whole thing where they found a royal mummy, and they said it was Nefertiti. No one ever disputed that it wasn't, and now they're going to find her again, but they never found her in the first place. Now, with anything that's been written about Amarna, it just drives me up the wall, really, because they're, you know, they say that Naughton was crazy, and he was deformed, and, and you know, the Amun priesthood was so great, and they, they, he closed all the temples and went to one god, and they were wi- worshipping a son. That's not what was going on there at all. Like, I spent the better part of 50 years researching this. Well, you know, let me let me jump in really quick. And that's funny that you point all of that out, because the club foot, the deformed, the the uh, the health history, uh, the genealogy between him and Akhenaten uh, it is all now uh, accepted fact. You know what but I mean? It's completely false. Right. Interesting. Like I could talk to you for three days about it all. And 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 the other thing is that you know the, the Almond priesthood they were nasty and they were care- they were collecting fifty percent of everybody's harvest for taxes. And then the Naughton and Nefertiti they were they were really tired of the fact that it wasn't spiritual. And so they decided to start all over again. And what was going on at Amarna was equal. It was peaceful. It was creative. It was it was matriarchal. It wasn't it wasn't hierarchy and I got all, I got the power. You don't. You're my slave. You know that kind of thing. It, it just wasn't like that. And no, it was 50-50, right? Yeah, it was 50 Well, we haven't had peace on the planet since. Right. I mean, to me, they're the most interesting people. Now, when the Almond Priesthood, you know, they they, they found out that King Tut, he was Tutankhaten, and then they changed his name to Tutankhamun, and then he was had a foot on each shore, because he did, when the, the Almond Priesthood came and took over, and he, he ruled for nine years. But then they found out that, um, that, that he was really of the Aten, and so they knocked him off. His tomb was a cache for mummies, and they quickly took them out, grabbed a bunch of stuff from Amnarna, and threw it all in there. Well, they didn't have time to put a secret room in there. First, and the other thing is that once, I think the Amun priesthood came back and killed Akhenaten, and the room in the river kind of deal, and, and Nefertiti was so heartbroken and just in such despair, she left. And so it's my conviction that she left and she took some artifacts and then they came and, you know, flattened the place and that she walked out of Egypt. So we're not going to find her. She didn't get a royal burial as far as I can see from any of thing anyway, but there's another thing here. Recently here in the last month, someone that, that I'm working with, sister lives in another country and there was this find and uh, they started firing pictures at me and I'm looking at this stuff gold, as good as King Tut, um, a sarcophagus that looks just like, very similar. Like, there's nothing else like King Tut's sarcophagus around. And and this was quite similar, and I'm looking at all these statues and stuff, and it's, and it's got all the gods and goddesses, which, I, and I'm like, this is the Amarna period, like, that's in that type of, and then I look, there was a statue of Akhenaten, all gold, Jimmy, found, undisturbed, Where, uh, uh, out, uh, uh, outside of Egypt, I won't say more. Uh, that, that's waiting. my next question. <laughs> well, of course, okay. no. But the thing is, is, is I probably shouldn't t- be telling you anyway. But no, that's not. It's, it's. I'm not really telling you anything. And and I'm set up. I've been invited to come and photograph it, but we don't have the green light. And 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 and. But no, nonetheless, I've seen these pictures, and I can tell. Like there's other videos out there of finds, and I can tell that it's fake. You know, because the proportions are wrong, and the hands are too small, and there's just lots of things wrong with it. So, and so lots uh, of people want to say they have treasures, but I'm telling you, this thing, and there's loads of stuff. Like, they sent me, like, 150 pictures and nine videos, and there's stuff there's stuff from all over, but there's a lot of stuff. you trust the source? Well, it's a family um, 
it's a sister of somebody who's connected to it, or somebody I work with, and I, I won't, I won't, I want to know the dating and all that. But there's two things they found that I found particularly interesting. Like you know me with angels and archetypes and evolutionary math of feminine consciousness. I'm really, really interested in what happened to matriarchal cultures, and none of anything in these finds are warring or, or arrowheads or spears or anything. It's all matriarchal art. And I'm telling you, this stuff is fantastic, made out of all different kinds of metals and the jewelry is just absolutely exquisite. So the the find the people who found it scraped away some of it because it's wooden statues with gold leaf over the top. And you know carbon fourteen dating makes things look younger. Uh-huh. Well the date came back. Are you ready? Uh huh. Fifteen thousand years ago. What? Which means that it would have been a treasure in the time of Atlantis handed down to the Egyptians. Right. And so the, oh, okay, okay. I, I was going to ask if this was uh, Nefertiti's booty that she spirited out of Egypt. It's not. Well, 50- yeah, that's what, that's what my gut tells me. Interesting. And if she was going to be taking stuff, I would say that she would want to show that all this nonsense about the one God and all that, that's not even true. That's what Catholicism did. But they never got rid of Hathor and Isis and Mott and all that stuff. So the, in, in the find, there is one of everything. There's a Sekhmet, there's an Anubis, there's a, you know, it goes on and on, a Ta, you know, one of everything, of every god and goddess. So that, to me, points exactly to the falsehood. But the thing is, is people, when they, they say something's false, they say something false, other people pick it up and repeat it. So there's a couple of researchers out there or writers, who, who say that Akhenaten is Moses. Well, it's 800 years separate in the timeline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got you know, friends then, that say that, too, and and it's uh, it's interesting, and that 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 uh, that has also picked up steam lately uh, as well. Yeah, but back it up. You just can't say, I'm right because he said so. That's right. as bad as I'm right because I said so. Well, now let's let's back up a second here. So now, when you're looking at that, when you say there is one of everything, is the look, is the look? Oh man, I don't want to sound naive here, but just go with me on this, Carmen. Is the look like 2500 BC Egypt? Does it have that look to it? But it's 15,000 years old. Help me out here. Is that? Is that what you're well, describing? Well, we're never going to get to the bottom of it. And the thing is, is that we can't be definitive and say it is. But a lot of times, you, 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 anyway, I'm not going to be definitive here. Right. To me, it is what their art looked like, exactly. But I, it never occurred to me that it was possible that they didn't make it. Well, everybody inherits something from their grandmother, and they've got the, jewel, you know, the jewelry and the, you know, the brooch from you know, their great-grandmother that gets passed down. Right. But this opens up another whole thing, and there's another to find. So... Um, so the Minoan culture, and again, it wasn't the palace of King Minos. This was clearly a, a matriarchal culture where you see all those, you know, they're, they're doing acrobats on bulls and that sort of thing. And Gavin Menzies, who's done a lot of work, he was writing a book on called 1491 before Columbus got there, talking about what the Indians were doing, and they could have had Chinese, you know, influenced descendants and that sort of thing walking across the... But then he found this stuff in, in, at, in, at Nassos, and he stopped his book, and then he wrote a book about the, the ties of the Minoans to Atlantis. Right, right, right. And that is particularly interesting. Anyway, so for years I had this one of the, there's three women, and they have these little um, jackets on, and you can see they're bare breasted, and they've got pearls and jewels in their hair, and incredibly ornate hair. And, and, and you know, if they're in a warring situation, they're not going to spend two hours on their hair every day, A. B, these are absolutely classic looking, and I had this, this, this replica of it in my house for years, and um, so they found these coins that is like just the head of these, with the, the, the hair and the whole thing, it's exactly like them. The back of the coin is an owl, and there was a whole set of them, and they were silver, and then a couple of days later, they found gold ones. I mean, I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff, but so they asked me, well, what date would that have been? And interestingly, um, the the, my, uh, the the Minoan culture was contemporary with the 18th dynasty, Hatshepsut, Nefertiti, if not, and taught all of them. Right. And so I said, well, it would have been at least 3,300 years ago. They go, nope, we got it dated 6,800 years ago. I'm like, what? What? 3,000 years what? before the Bronze Age? Wow. Yeah, well, see, we got the whole picture wrong. We, everything yeah. is backwards, upside down, and inside out. 
And, um, and, and the truth is an option in our culture. There's the one right answer hypothesis for school, A, B, C, D. You give the answer the teacher wants, whether it's true or not. Right. Um, you know, all these court cases where you have to find somebody to blame, close the case, put somebody in jail. Okay, it's, that's who did it. it. That's often not the case. You just want to give Zahi a heart attack and put him away forever. That's what you're doing. <laughs> See? Well, what? No, the thing is, is that there's Zahi's already out of the picture. He's on to other things. Yes, 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 yes. He's long gone. But the thing, everybody, you know, how many times he'd be on uh, chasing mummies, and I'd get all these phone calls. What is the matter with him? He's rude. He's screaming at people. <laughs> <laughs> and then that that video that uh, Graham Hancock was supposed to have a debate with him. Yes. And you know, he was just completely poorly behaved, and people are like, "What?" I'm like, "No, that's him. I know him. I sat in his office for a whole day at a time." Many times, and he's—that's he, how he behaves. That's it, him. Yeah, it, all you know, it, he's too old to realize or to come to grips with. Everybody's got a cell phone camera these days, pal. You need to behave, even if even if you have to fake it, because that stuff lays out there forever. And now, no matter what, that's your legacy. Your legacy is that moment with Hancock that day before the presentation. But a lot of people were surprised to see that. I'm like, well, where have you been? <laughs> Sorry. Like, <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so, yeah, so anyway, really, anyway. There's, there's brand new stuff coming here. There's And it's it's all, you know, we don't even know if it's going to be photographed properly, which is why I'm, you know, on standby waiting to go. Um, people are interested in selling it, not, not, not recording it. But that doesn't matter. Like it, whether I go or not, I've seen the pictures, and I and I I was looking. I said, "This is from Amarna." I just recognized this stuff right away, and uh, and down in the court, tiny little picture, right? These are cell phone pictures that were sent, you know, to the sister. Right. And sure enough, there was a not an. Oh my God! I just about had a heart attack. It, it, now, I, when you say you're on standby, can you do you anticipate you know this week, next week, uh, like the very, very near future, going out and seeing this for yourself? It's possible, but we're waiting. It, it, all systems have to be go before, and so I had all my cameras all charged up, and uh, I waited for two weeks, and then I put them away. Um, <laughs> so um, it's still definitely on the on the on the books to go. So we'll see, uh, and it's too soon to tell. But again, I would want to see the dating lab and the certificate from the dating, and you know, examine it and get the story. But um, well, but anyway, it's pretty it, exciting. Exactly, and this could be—I mean, this is huge news. And you always manage to come on the show and do this to me too, as well. Thank you for doing it. But <laughs> it, 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 could it be a situation that? I mean, what does your gut tell you? You know, the classic thing, you know, if it's too good to be true, right? What What does your gut tell you right now? Uh, it, it's real. And and the thing is, is that, you know, there's so much stuff from so many places. And, and, you know, they were firing pictures at me for like two hours. And I was like, well, that's from Troy and that's Greek and that's Greco-Roman and that's... And I've been in, you know, the museums around the world looking at this stuff and, and doing the, the research for so long that I, I have another picture of something that looks like that. So these are treasures that, you know, and in patriarchal times, it's like, you know, bang, you're dead. I want your stuff. Okay, now it's mine. Well, bang, you're dead. I want your stuff. Now it's mine. And how long does that keep going? And so, you know, this is a huge stash. It's actually 10 rooms. This is like national treasure. Wow. And my gut told me when I watched National Treasure, I went, no, it's not all in one room. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's, and let's, Spirit let's... also told me that before the final part of the New Atlantis, that there would be a find. And this is the third thing that I, the possibility, at first I thought it was this, and then I thought it was a Hawara, and, and well, now I'm like, well, this is like on a silver platter. Let's take and a break. So, well, let's take a break right there. We'll pick that up on the back side. Our guest tonight is Dr. Carmen Bolter. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with the good doctor right after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Hi, hey folks. Life Change T here, reminding you that colds and flus suck. Feeling lousy sucks, and allergies really can be annoying. What if you could change that? What if you could drink something that changed the sick and tired scenario? Well, you can change how you feel with a little help from Life Change Tea. Life Change Tea is a drink you make, you control, and you drink. There are eight organic herbs that blend together and give you what you need to fight the flus and colds of this world. Less sickness is more relief. Life Change Tea can help with high blood pressure, constipation, high cholesterol, and much, much more. Just by drinking the tea. Read the numerous testimonies at GetTheTea.com. If you're tired of feeling lousy, order right now at GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. If you've heard this commercial more than once and someone's trying to tell you something, it's time to get well. GetTheTea.com. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. (laughs) (laughs) We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Hello, Fade or Not. Are you looking for the ultimate Bluetooth speaker system? Well, check this out. The Studio Dome Surround Sound System. Featuring the Studio Dome 1 SD1 and the Studio Boombox SBB wireless Bluetooth speakers is the perfect way to get surround sound without all of the cable headaches. With its own hard shell custom carrying case for taking your surround sound experience on the go. Each hard shell case comes packed with an SBB, two SD1s, cables, and power. It's just 99 bucks. And you use the promo code Jimmy, and you get yourself some free shipping. Once again, Studio Dome brings you the best deal on the net anywhere. Just go to the Studio Dome banner, JimmyChurchRadio.com, promo code Jimmy, go back Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, the planet. Welcome back, Fade to Black. This is truly bespoke radio for the masses. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Dr. Carmen Bolter is with us. We're talking a little Egypt, and uh, we're going to talk about the new Atlantis, her new series uh, that is uh, in post-production right now. Now, uh, Carmen, before the break, we were addressing uh, the Nefertiti Chamber uh, what if it's not Nefertiti? Is there? Do you think there could be a room back there? Certainly, King Tut's tomb was always too small. Do you think that there's something back there? Well, I think it was a cache for other mummies. Like six mummies were just put in there, and then they needed a tomb in a hurry because they killed him. Right, right. And so right. they just they just piled it all up and put and buried him in a really big hurry. So. Um, the chances of having a well-fashioned room that's hidden that was deliberate to me are very unlikely. It's not likely at all. Okay. And I really don't think they're ever going to find Nefertiti or not. That is just, I'm so solid with that in my bones. You're killing Um, my dream. 
you <laughs> I, so, yeah but finding this this other stuff i know like, well okay so that you to me speaks very loudly you made that, up for that it she, that she could have left and it was the best stuff and i've never seen another sarcophagus that rivals king tuck made out of solid gold and it's not open, so and so people are saying, well, maybe she's in there, and maybe he's in there, and maybe it's empty, and maybe we don't know. But I don't. I'm not putting my money on that. Uh, what do you, what do you think? A month, two months, three months? When do you think this announcement uh, could could go public? Well, I don't think anybody's planning on like they're. I don't know if it's going to end up in a museum or whatever. Um, if I go, I can make the announcement. Okay, and you'll do it Once right here. Once I get here. the pictures, I can tell you where it is, and and I hope to to, to include that in the series. But um, if we, you know, it's I'm hopeful. Um, I'm talking to them every day. Right. And so um, it's just a question of the timing and all the pixels being in order. Right. And the woman who's been funding these, the people who've been looking now for four years, hasn't seen it yet either. So. Okay. Anyway, well, that's so exciting. She really wants to go, and she would bring me down there. So. Well, give me the scoop. That's all I ask. And uh, we'll do it here. We'll we'll do it on Coast to Coast. I think this is a (laughs) pre-scoop. Yeah, we scooped the pre-scoop. I haven't told anybody, Jimmy. (laughs) Yeah, exciting. I mean, I, I just tweeted out. Uh, that uh, I, I forgot how to talk for a minute. <laughs> I did. I was like, what? Uh, now, okay, now let's go to the imaging of the Great Pyramid. Uh, what do you think is going on there? I, uh, well, that's... I don't think it is the Great Pyramid. I think they're talking Dashur. Uh, well, the imaging that they did on the bottom three stones uh, at the Great Pyramid showed the temperature change. And uh, the possibility of there being a room behind that. It's right at the base of the Great Pyramid on the, uh, I think it's on the south side. Okay. Now, what is the scanning technology that they're using? It, you know, from what I've seen of their equipment, um, it's pretty inferior stuff. And last time I was on, we talked about the depth of the scan and the power of this scan that Klaus Donna has been doing. And, uh, and and so this is like cutting-edge technology, and I think that they've gone backwards to a technology that's not nearly as precise, but also not nearly as deep. My understanding of that scanning technology is it goes four feet, four meters deep. That's nothing. Right, so, right. In, in, and it's not very precise, so there's an anomaly, and it reminds me of when they were looking for the the chamber that Edgar Casey talked about on the left, beside the left paw of the Sphinx years ago. Right. And they were there with a sledgehammer and a plate and an arrow that went and went, yep, there's something down there. <laughs> right. Like, That's not very precise. Well, you know? I, I think they, uh, la- or two weeks ago, uh, they made an announcement that they were going to do this uh, announcement about both sites on May 1st, that they're going to, uh, definitively do their final scans on on both and and make this announcement May first. I'm uh, and we're we're sitting right now March fifteenth, so I think we have a month and a half. Or was it April first? Oh, it might have been April first. They were doing the announcement. I I did the story two weeks ago. I can't remember. Yeah, thermal imaging. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't think I, 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 Egypt, you know, everything's a little bit broken in Egypt, I always say, and they don't have access to the very sophisticated technology. And I just, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a, a naysayer, but um, I don't think there's much, there's much to it. And I think that they've been trying to get their own scans because of this other thing, because the ones that wanted to take the Hawara scan for me and I went public instead, uh, you know, they were disappointed that they couldn't use that and claim it as theirs, and now they're looking for other scan scanning techniques. Now yeah. let's uh, let's talk about the new Atlantis. Uh, I know that you've been working on this. Your original uh, this goes back to 2012, 2013. Yep, that's right. Twelve. Uh, I started filming for it in 2012. 2012. And what was uh, obviously when it when you do something like this, there's a motivation behind it. What happened and why Why the new Atlantis? And and when you say uh, the title and you put, when you say new and you put that in it, what are you implying? Okay, well, I was approached when I was speaking in St. Petersburg 
uh, but Valerie Uvaroff, who wrote a book called The Pyramids and who has built new pyramids in uh, Siberia, Tomsk. And uh, there's a project that's got two names. One's Project 12 and the other's New Atlantis. And he approached me um, when I was at this conference speaking uh, to do a documentary series for him claiming that he had funding. And the funding fell through, and I said, well, if there's no funding, I'm going to keep going and do it anyway. So it was through him that it got its title. And the idea is uh, 12 different domains where there's paradigm shifts in education, transportation, communication, health, goes on, agriculture, just about anything you can think of. They're you know, looking at new ways to get energy and, and, and beekeeping and all these different things that will help humanity move forward as opposed to breaking everything down. And they were using the model of Plato's description of Atlantis as the map. So there's a big pyramid in the middle, and it's finished. I've, I've got the Google Earth coordinates, and then there's four pyramids going around the outside of that concentric circle, and then another one, another four. So nine pyramids at all, in all, with buildings dedicated to each of these domains that I've mentioned with scientists coming and the whole thing. So mm-hmm. that's the new part. But then, what did the ancients know? And Valerie actually engineered this pyramid. And uh, and so it's, it, he studied the double uh, uh, helix uh, in the quartz crystal under pressure. He used poured stone. They've got, you know, crushed quartz crystal in arms, black, white, underneath the structure that uh, replicate the, 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 the galaxy. I mean, this is really sophisticated. And inside the pyramid, like in between the chambers, there are 14-foot quartz crystals from Brazil that are under pressure because of the stones. And the casing stone, it was, it was actually poured on like a fondant icing, and then it hardened. And that's made out of cr- crushed quartz crystal. It, uh, I've, yeah. seen, I've seen some of the pictures of it, and it looks, uh, you know what, it looks really expensive. <laughs> it cost five million dollars yes it it's got that look to it i it but is... you know who paid for it it's a produce company who wanted to energize the food they wanted something to warehouse produce in before it got on the trucks to make it healthier for people and so this pyramid is functional and there was you know people get spontaneous healings in there and they're healed forever and it's just like it's really quite remarkable so but i started looking at well all the stuff they tell us about atlantis so one of my earliest um, past life readings, way back, um, you know, they said something about me and my role in Atlantis. And, um, and so I spent, you know, the better part of my life wondering what does that mean and could it have been and where would it have been and, and listening to all this stuff on Atlantis. And there is so much garbage and contradiction out there where people stand there and I know, I know, and this is what it was. And it wasn't 9,000 years, it was 9,000 moons. And, and Plato was brokenhearted because Socrates, his mentor, was sentenced to death and he drank poison. And he was so full of grief that he made up this fantasy and it's not true. Or, you know, Plato said there were elephants. Well, there can't be elephants at Santorini, so uh, it's a myth. You know, and, and like this guy said this and this guy said that and everybody going around and it's Antarctica and it's here and it's there and nope, doesn't meet the criteria and then they throw the whole thing up. This, these are the documentaries that are about Atlantis that make my stomach turn and they make me very angry indeed because it's like something must have happened. Who are, you know, and how is it that the Mayans and the Egyptians and the Sumerians and the ancient Chinese and the ancient Indians all have the same sort of thing. Stories of flying ships and and agriculture and civilization, and it looks like they never talk to each other. Well, this is a third-party hypothesis. Maybe they all had similar ancestors. So how can we look at the whole situation differently? And what did Plato actually say? And is there a place on the planet that has all those characteristic features? So I spoke at a conference in Java, of all places, Indonesia, not long ago, in December. And the, the entire conference, I was keynote, there was only three speakers, it was one day. Every person was talking about the evidence of Atlantis in Java. Right, right, right. And one of the guys did a checklist. So Plato said this, and 
uh, Crimaeus and Titanus, or whatever those words are, in Plato's um, sections of which passage said what, that there were coconuts and there were elephants, and they had two seasons, a rainy and a dry, and they irrigated, and all these different points, a number of them, I think it's 63 and, you know, Troy had 41%, and all these different places that people have claimed could be Atlantis, Straits of Gibraltar, Azores Islands, you know, on and on, Antarctica, uh, High Altiplano, South America, had a certain number of points that added up, and they got a percent. And Java gets 100%. Hmm. Yeah, the two-season aspect uh, takes a lot off the checklist. Well, whatever. There's many, many things. But right. what is the real research in terms of how the water levels changed? And it's the ring of fire. Right. And, and, and so the other thing is that there's a lot of focus on the last flood. And Graham Hancock's got a new book out, um, you know, focusing on this worldwide. But what about before that? So Atlantis lasted long, and they said, oh, yeah, they, they, they were doing all these experiments with animals and humans. And, you know, they got corrupt and abused the power of the crystals. And so God sent a flood. Well, if that was 13,000 years ago and we're in the bottom of the Iron Age of the dark now, right. then that would have been a golden age. And if you say corruption brings floods, you think we don't have enough corruption going on? Right, right, right. Hello, right. where's the flood? You know, if that's the cause and effect. So I've just been trying to sort through all these different things and show, you know, with real stuff, um, how these pyramids are older, how a lot of the pyramids are pre-flood. And so they would, like the Bosnian Pyramid, covered with silt and then grew trees. And that's been dated to 38,000 years. And Gunong Padang, where I also filmed, um, 26,000 years. Right. Gobleki Tepe, they say 13, but it could be a lot older. Right. Gobleki Tepe was decommissioned. Um, uh, the Bosnian Pyramid Tunnel System was decommissioned, filled with rubble, as though they had some prior knowledge. It makes sense that they could have had technology to detect some of these earth changes, but also they had been through it before. So my information from ancient texts and from various uh, astrophysics and various things that fit together uh, was that there was a major catastrophe 58,000 years ago, and they had some kind of forward warning 17,500 years ago with corresponds to big solar flare activity and that sort of thing and reversal of the sun's magnetic poles. And then 13,660 some years ago. So, you know, I think it's, it, you know, but we're, we're taught everything's 5,000 years old. It's nothing's older than that. And the Bible and school and everything says that that's how old we are. And that's what the pyramid code was opening up too. We could be much, much older processional cycles. Well, how about, okay, two, three processional cycles more maybe. And so, you know, if there's been three world floods, then you're not going to find the diamond drill bit that you wouldn't even find if you dropped it in your own lawn, you know, right, yesterday. Right, right, So, right. you know, but evidence of things that they did and what's the similarity in the cultures and that sort of thing. And you will believe what I've been finding because I'm, I'm looking very, very diligently for, for evidence of how all this fits together. And... Um, well, I found, well, I, well, okay. I, I want to know about that because we 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 are trying to. There's there's no question that the pyramids in in Giza are much older than you know the 2500 BC. That that's out. That that's it. I don't buy into that. Again, I haven't been there, Carmen. So please respect. Uh, you know, I will admit that. But what I don't see here is logic. And that's the for problem. Uh, the logic, logic for what? For them being built at 2500 BC when you have a 7,000. No, no, it doesn't fit. It, it doesn't, doesn't fit, fit with anything. It doesn't. It and, might have been the last restoration, but as I said before, the last time you painted your house has nothing to do with the year your house was built. Exactly right. Nothing. That's exactly right. And so the pieces that you're starting to find are the ones that I think all of us are trying. We're trying to make sense of this because a 7,000 year gap between Gobekli Tepe and and the building of the pyramids at 2500 BC and then uh, uh man was complete idiots in between all of that and nothing happened doesn't make sense and w we but can't we can't buy into that you know what the com the common word is about Gobekli Tepe from the people of Turkey between each other is that it's one of the gates to the garden of eden ah that's interesting yeah. and it's right there i mean the, the the border of turkey meets the border of syria that meets iraq it's right there, Koblecki Tepe, right on the south part of Turkey. 
And you know what and else that's is also really close to Katal Hayuk, which is the only site that they declare as matriarchal fertility goddess. I was that. just going to bring that up, and that's an- and then the Amazons. <laughs> there's evidence of forty two thousand years ago the Amazons being there in northern Turkey. I mean, this is a hotbed. This is along the Silk Road. This is these are the trading routes. This is this is you know where history was happening. And around Gobekli Tepe, no weapons. No arrowheads, you know, no weapons of and, and, war. And no pottery. They didn't live there. They they went and did ritual there, and everything's round. And, you know, when you when you listen to the people in charge talking about Gobekli Tepe, you know, they're saying, well, we can't figure out why we find red, white, and black. Matriarchal. We can't figure out why everything spirals. Matriarchal. Right. Why are the buildings round? Matriarchal. You know, <laughs> You know, like one word would would give them answers, <laughs> to, and it seems so elementary to me because that whole area is 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 the the the, the beginning of it all. The so middle, so, how are you filling in the blanks? Uh, what have what have you been finding? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Hmm. So um, when you asked me if I was surprised at some of the eventualities that came from the Pyramid Code, let me tell you, I was surprised when I got to Indonesia and had a very strong fan base there. And the man who organized the logistics for this trip had posted, and I had a link on my website, and so everywhere we went, there were people coming to meet me. And I'm like, what is going on here? Right? We go to Starbucks, and then, oh, Dr. Crum is going to be at Starbucks. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know? In a restaurant in Bali, somebody recognized me because they'd seen the Pyramid Code and bought the whole table dessert. I mean, I'm like, you got to love me? that. Yeah, you got to love that. That's cool. Okay. So, but then, so the people from uh, Jakarta were radioing their friends in other parts of Java, because we went from one end of Java to the other in this trip filming, um, and said, well, they're going to be at this hotel on this day. Go see them. And, um, and this guy, he was so pleased with my work that he bought my whole crew our train tickets, and when we got to this new place, he had hired a driver for the day to take us wherever we wanted to go and paid for it all, wouldn't hear of us paying for it. It's like, <laughs> I was like, well, thank you very much. Anyway, so he sent these three people over, and uh, two of them didn't speak English, and one of them was translating, and who's, you know, part of a very a, a royal family there. And uh, these guys had stories. Anyway, the, the long and short of it is, they showed me pictures from Sumer lining up with this one temple. There is a temple in Java that looks, if I showed you a picture of it, you'd say, that's in Mexico, that's Mayan. And it's okay. It's like so where all these races come together. So they had, and I mentioned it before, East Indian. So they had a picture of something that's East Indian, and then something at this particular temple. And then there's something that's Mayan, and it something that you see at Palenque, and it's there's something exactly like it at this temple. Greek, um, Sumerian, Egyptian, with the distended skulls. And you get to this temple, and they say, "Oh yeah, it was built in 1671." And you know there was this beautiful princess. So people came from all over the world. Uh, Because they wanted to marry her. Egyptian women wanted to marry her? I don't think so. You know, it's like, no, I don't think you got the right story. But that's that's where you start. Whatever they tell you the date is, it's usually wrong. You don't know what's underneath. Like even Borobudur, which is stated to have been built in 1200 AD. Well, is there anything underneath it? Yes. Right? Yes. You know, do the legends support that? Yes. And there's also Mayan stuff at Borobudur. I mean, this is just absolutely mind-boggling. So... I got a field producer and went to this place and filmed it. Aerial footage, the whole thing. I flew the quadcopter. I'm a pilot. Um, and, and, and photographed it. And I'm telling you, it's mind-boggling. So what they're basically trying to say is all these groups are related. Now, jumping the gun to put it together to, to make a story here. Well, it's not make a story. It's to explain it. Okay. Right. If there was a foreknowledge of a flood, let's just say it's us now and we're, we're at the table and we're on the evacuation committee knowing that a disaster is coming. We've got some time to figure things out and what to do. What are you going to do with the stuff? How are you going to help the planet? How are you going to help the people? What are you going to do? And so it's my conviction that there was a decision to, to go and colonize the planet on the telluric currents to build pyramids that actually were going to help because of the way they were positioned and, and connecting energetics into the center of the earth, the, the, the core, to help the magnetics not flip their poles. Part of what caused one of the catastrophes is the north and south magnetic poles flipped. We can't hang on to things. So 
what would hold those magnetic grids in place. And so let's say we had to colonize these five cultures that I've been talking about, right? And we go to these places and build some pyramids and da da da. Okay. So let's say we sent all the hip hop kids with their own music and their own way of dressing to one place and all the ballerinas to another one and all the firemen to another one. Like we have lots of sets of people, groups that have their own music, their own you know, way of speaking to each other. Dress, clothes, language, yes, yes. Right? Yes. And then never the train shall meet. You're not going to find a hip-hop person with a ballerina, right? And, and then it doesn't mix. So the Mayans, you know, put feathers in their hair or whatever and went over there and built their stuff. But they all had the same civilization, civilizing processes, agriculture, you know, whatever, however they did yeah, their... Yeah, that core business. knowledge. It's all similar. Right, oh. right, right. Right? Yes. And so... Perhaps the Atlanteans were the ancestors. These groups seem different, but there's a lot more similar astronomy, geometry, you know, all these different things, these sciences that they understood. And we've just glommed over the whole thing and assumed that, you know, the ancients were retarded and were, were better. Right. But I, I, think the, I, I, I think this is a smoking gun. I mean, I've got the footage of this place that has all these cultures represented. And I'm telling you, it's... it's it, it's, I'm going to de- be able to demonstrate it, but I've got a lot of other things that, that piece the thing together, and including, you know, the things about, you know, plasma tubes and gamma rays and Fermi bubbles and all these things that science is just, you know, starting to understand. Oh, the other thing. Oh, wait till you hear this. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. We're going to hit a break in three minutes. So let's save that other thing for after the break. But um, what about, uh, if you can quickly address this, <coughs> sorry about that. What about China? Are we yeah. ever going to get in there and check these pyramids out? Why are they deliberately, if there's ever been a disinfo campaign, right, in real time, it's China and these pyramids. What, what is it that they're trying to hide? And, and are we ever going to get in there and get a, a, get a look? I went. What did you see? I saw I saw stuff, and I didn't see them all, and I certainly didn't have aerial footage, but I went to the heart of where those pyramids are, and you can see them from Google Earth. There's aerial photographs of them from you know World War II and planes flying over, and they were trying to... But the thing is, now it's known in the constellations that they represent. I've got the GPS of every single pyramid in China. There's 70 of them or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I've looked at them, too, on Google Earth. And But the thing is, I want to know about construction, what's on the inside. Uh, they're, they're the same, very, very similar. Some of them have flat tops. That doesn't mean they're step pyramids. They're very similar in terms of angles and size to the Giza pyramids and Bosnian pyramid, which is possibly bigger than the Great Pyramid. But th- th- it's, it's, it's the same family. It's the same technology. And then there's all the stone circles everywhere, too, that would have most certainly been to represent the alignments that had been lost once, you know, because the planet did get struck and the axis of the Earth shifted by 14 degrees, which caused all kinds of you know, problems and having to regroup. And so that knowledge is in stone circles. And most of them, did you know that 75% of the stone circles in the world are in Ireland? Uh, well, and then you have the other million or so that are in South Africa, too, as well, with Michael Tellinger. Oh, no, but that's a different kind of stone circle. We've yeah. got Adam's calendar. But the, the, the circles that are the, the, the made of the smaller stones are not the same thing as Stonehenge-style ones. Right, 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 right. They are stones. They're known as stone circles. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And I find that fascinating, too, as well, with the with the dating on all of this. That that whole, like you said, that whole, 20, you know, 5,000 years ago, it was the beginning of everything. It simply is not. I cannot wait until academia just bows under pressure and starts to really talk about this and, and put some science to this. Well, because... And then you've got Michael Cremo, who, who's looking, he's using potassium argon dating, and he's coming up with skeletons that are a million years old. That's right. That's right. Right? And then he, 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 he had a very tough go of it, you know, 20 years ago. There's a, a, a YouTube video of him being interviewed on all these television shows when he's so young. And uh, he's dealing with the same stuff now as he was then. Yeah. Like, I... there's no more real acceptance, but we've got internet and we've got your kind of radio show and conferences to discuss this this is fade to black our guest tonight dr carmen bolter and after the break we're going to get to her whoa the other big thing right after this short break stay with us
Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Not being able to fall asleep is so frustrating. The tossing, the turning, the adjustment of pillows and blankets. Ugh! Eventually, you just decide to get up and start your day really early. It doesn't have to be this way, though. Power Sleep is an all-natural, non-prescription formula that will help you sleep like a baby. It contains neurotransmitter nutrients that promote the production of serotonin, which is responsible for feelings of well-being. Power Sleep is easy to digest and absorb and is made in a base of active probiotics. Don't miss another night of sleep. Order your Power Sleep at energywave.com or call 800-TURTLE-5. Add Power Vites to your cart while you're browsing. Perfect for Monday mornings. They're a complete multivitamin and mineral formula that will give you the energy you need to get through your day. Nourish your immune system and feel great. Get all the info and place your order at energywave.com. Enter code word SLEEP to get free shipping. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. Back goes Lewis to the wall, and it's out of here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Carmen Bolter. Yeah, we're discussing pyramids and her new documentary, which is uh, about to come out. We'll talk about that, too, as well. Uh, The release date is uh, the new series is The New Atlantis. Now, uh, Carmen, right before the break, you said, oh, I I, I got another big thing. So (laughs) here you go. So, um, again, um, somebody sent me their book, and uh, I I took an interest and called the guy up, and it turned out that there was a chapter about Coral Castle. And I had just done an extended film shoot. I was on the road for seven weeks in the fall uh, and gone. My film producer met me in Miami, and you know Coral Castle and Edward Lead Scallion's work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of people who are interested in this material are familiar. There's a lot of people who've never heard of him. And so he died with a secret, and most people will say that he had understood the secrets of anti-gravity and built this whole place by himself, and he's five foot tall, some people say he's five foot four, but still he weighed under 100 pounds. Right, skinny little guy. he would work at night, and he was lifting these stones, and then he decided to move the whole thing and put everything on a flatbed truck when nobody was watching, and then the truck driver showed up in the morning, he did it all at night, and they drove it somewhere, and he said, bye-bye, come back later. And he unloaded the whole thing by himself and put everything back in place. And there's like two-story, everything's built. And some of the stones are taller than Stonehenge. 
and some of the stones are heavier than Giza. So go figure, he figured something out. And so, you know, spirits tell me, take a picture of this wall. And anyway, so this, there was something about, okay, the book that I'm referring to is called Electrified Ancient Egyptians. And the subtitle is Penetrating the Atom with Electrified Sperm. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. So this guy, James Ernest Brown, and we're filming in his lab. He calls it his Arcs and Sparks lab. Um, Friday, actually, we're doing a full shoot of him for, this is one of the, the, the things we're, we're, we're at. We're not adding, but it's, it's, we're right at the end. But it's, you know, and I'm, I'm not, like I'm in post-production here. I'm not even going to go on that shoot. My film producer is going to do it. But anyway, so he's looking at all these instruments and in the motion of the sun and the sundial that shows equinoxes and solstices at Coral Castle and the fact that Ed Leeds Scallion had metal on the bottom of his boots, and I was like looking at his boots in the showcase going, what is it about those boots, right? And it's a whole thing about whether you're grounded or you're conducting. The, the gold uh, sandals that you see in the museum, you're thinking, well, that would cut your feet. You'd never wear those. Uh, the storyline that King Tut's sarcophagus was inside a shrine, which was inside a shrine, which was inside another one. Well, actually, the sarcophagus wouldn't fit in the shrine. All those shrines were kind of scattered about in his tomb. But what they are is a, a, a style of Faraday cage. They're gold on the outside, gold on the inside. You see what they call mummification beds with wooden feet. And it's all what conducts and what doesn't, right? And so he, his bed was suspended. His chair was suspended. He's wrapping copper wire. Where's the copper wire hanging right by the door in the tool room? What was his perpetual motion machine that he made? Uh, you know, some kids were riding their bicycles and they leaned them up, six-year-old girls leaned them up against the wall and peered over and saw him holding his hands up with a stone floating. So what was he doing and how was he doing it? And and what were the ancients able to do? So they have these toe covers that you see that are gold, finger covers, nipple covers, eyelid covers, tongue covers, and then they were able to direct energy. Um, and, and they had this, and then and then they were literally electrifying themselves and they, their transmutation um, tables, and this guy's James has figured out how this works, and it totally fits with Ed Leeds Scallion. So, hmm. wait a minute. So, um, he he when Scallion died in '51 or something like that, uh, James Ernest Brown wanted to try to buy the place, and I have a copy of the check and the offer to purchase the property. And during that time, um, when he thought he was going to buy the place, and they were still looking for you know, relatives, and they did find it, and it ended up the sale didn't go through. But there was original footage from Coral Castle of Ed there when he was younger, and his notes, and uh, eight by 10 pictures that he took with a brownie camera with a timer when he was by himself. Mm -hmm. They sent me the notes, and the pictures, and the footage that's never been shown. And it's in the New Atlantis. Uh, he didn't have nipple covers and... No, not him. Not him. Not okay, him. okay, no, okay. The Egyptians did. But, but interesting. And now, could... The, okay, let's go back. Now, that, that I, I like this. So if we go back to Java, right, and we go back to that concept of uh, the, the, the cultures, you know, spreading around the world, could that knowledge, not only from Java, but it, and and uh, which is shared at Coral Castle, go with me on this. Would this answer the the megalithic issues that we have in Cusco and and down in Peru and the movements of these stones and 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 Baalbek and and certainly uh, back to the Giza Plateau as well. Stonehenge, yeah, the, it would apply to. Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It all. It, listen, it fits together, and all the stone circles. Are, it's all this Earth grid. Now, it's impossible to grasp what I'm saying in a conversation, which is why it takes years to make the animations and write the voiceover and get the music and and all that to put it together, so so that you can see. And it takes, you know, that's why there's five episodes, so we can develop these points. But, and like I said, I don't just go say something because I saw it once. It's got to be verifiable in some way. Right. And we're still in Never Never Land, you know, with Atlantis. But this, they were on to something, and there was knowledge that was making it work. And it starts to make sense when you understand timing, planetary systems, how the energy shifts at night, um, laden jars, like uh, Ed Leeds Scallion had no, no power. 
but he was you know so he had hot water he 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 had lights he he was making electricity right there on the site well and edward so, where did he ed, yeah ed lead scallion where did he get the knowledge from now you've well, read the notes he did from, he d- he came from latvia i think he probably is a reincarnate of somebody who was doing this work in egypt and he remembered I mean, what else is there? Like, to me, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm remembering stuff too, and then I run around the planet looking for how it fits together. And I've had, you know, lots of evidence of my past lives as well, right? Now, it doesn't give you the whole story, but it certainly gives a hypothesis and a drive and a motivation to figure it out. Sure, sure. And now, okay, help me out here. Are we saying then that Lead Scallion, uh, it wasn't necessarily supernatural, it, but it was a technology that he had somehow acquired. Yeah, a methodology, a combination of a small magnetics, a small field working electromagnetism. I used to say that when the Egyptians wore those bands around their arms, their wrists and ankles and uh, atop, upper arms, right. that that was to prevent them from getting electromagnetized. And Ed Scallion in his notes talks about, what is it? Magnicity. He said, it's not, you know, you can't have magnetism without electricity, and we get it all mixed up, and we call it whatever. But he says if, if there was a word called magnicity, he would use it, right? And so, um, yeah, he, it's, it's, a, it's a technology, and it's complex in that it's taking a lot of different things into account. And um, so from looking at that work and from his interest at Coral Castle, uh, James Ernest Brown has built a lab. And he claims, there's pictures in the book. Now, the other thing is that he went to Egypt in 78, and he's been going back, and he ended up taking 15,000 pictures and making himself a big book, four feet by five feet, and putting the pictures that were similar in groupings and staring at them until he got some kind of an aha, and then going and trying out uh, what they were doing. So he, had, he, he can demonstrate this sort of thing. He can repeat so he, it. He can repeat it, and one of the things that's in the book, and he says he's going to demonstrate for us on Friday with the cameras running, is having somebody, and he's got a replica of King Tut's throne. He says you, there's a way that you can have somebody sitting in, a ch- sitting in a chair with their eyes closed, and people can interfere with their auric field somehow with their hands, and the person will levitate. He told me the other day that a th- they levitated a 350-pound guy. And, and that would also answer how they got a lot of these uh, uh, sarcophagi into some of these chambers and upstairs at, at Giza. Uh, well, I think the other thing that we're missing, too, is the concept of poured stone. Joseph Davidovich goes into that, and I probably talked about that on your show before. I yes. have on other shows. Right. But there, even at, at Machu Picchu, I call them marshmallow stones. Right. They're right. like yeasted buns, so it's almost like there's something <laughs> in the curing. Yes. But they, they, would, they would expand, so that's why they didn't have, you know, seams. But how are you going to carry those stones up the top of Machu Picchu? The, the base of it's at 11,000 feet. The top's at 14,000. I mean, come on, you can't, you know, and even at Abu Rausch, you, you have to get the, py- the, the stones up a mountain before you get them up the pyramid. So it makes perfect sense to me that they were working with some, natron could have been used, um, and that's what they used for mummification that would kind of, they would make like swimming pool sizes of something like cement. Yeah, and I, then, you know, put the natron in it, and then, and that's how Valerie Uvarov did it. Yeasted, he, he yeasted and, buns. That's that's uh, the quote that's going to fly around on Twitter about a thousand times right now. Yeasted buns, because look, you're absolutely right. When you look at the the stones in not only not only in Peru, but the, it's the same kind of construction that is all over at different temples around Egypt too, as well, and, and around the world, where you have these fantastical fitting blocks that you know when you look at that there is no way somebody is carving that they 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 they, they would have to have architectural drawings and and extensive math and geometry that goes into that kind of drawing and construction and engineering or they did something simple they poured it they heated it and they molded it well, and there's stuff now of two different plants in Peru that can soften stone. So it could have been a real stone. They softened the outside of it. And then all over Egypt, you see where some of the frescoes have come away from the pillars or the walls. And it's a construction underneath. 
and the, the fresco part was applied. And so there's innies and outies, I call them, which would have been perhaps different molds. But then I started to notice, like at Camumbo, there was a whole row of the same kind of mold, but on the other side it was identical. And then there was another temple that had that same thing. And so I know that they were really using this as a tapestry to paint onto, well, paint metaphorically, to leave their secrets. Um, but some of it's repeated. Yeah, and, it, and it's mirrored. It's quite clear to me that it was poured because after something, and Davidovich showed this, right. that if you had something like granite that was poured after it cured, you can't tell the difference between something that's poured and something that's carved. Yeah, and, so, and when, you, when you see it mirrored, right, on one, on one side and then the exact same irregular shapes are on the other side, that, that's, a, that's a holy crap moment. And and then you see that over in Egypt, you know, Luxor or whatever. And then the exact same thing is going on in South America. Now you have this transoceanic transfer of knowledge that you're referring to coming out of Java. And it's the only thing that makes sense. Well, that's amazing. It's just it's the whole thing. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm used to it now, but I've been keeping my cards pretty close, so I haven't really been talking about these theories, but I am piecing it together. And, uh, and, and, and it, it, everybody brings their piece to the piece of the puzzle to the foreground. And, um, you know, James Ernest Brown has been working on this for 40 years. As I have, I went the first time in 77, and I've got 20,000 pictures, and so we've been staring at our pictures and going, oh, I've noticed something different. Same picture. And, and we're still noticing different things, like on the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera yesterday, all of a sudden we realized that Nui is standing on plas the, the symbol for plasma fields. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's all coming together, but we never imagined, like, well, you know, the pyramids are built by slaves and or the ego of the pharaoh. I mean, that's that's us talking, and that's gotten passed along. And and but the thing is, is that people haven't given up on understanding these secrets because it's not that satisfying. And even when people say, "When were the pyramids built and by who?" and I've been saying, "Well, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Poseidon hired the ABC Construction Company in 58,200 BC." Do you feel better? Yeah, right, right, right. Does that does, you got the answer? Yeah, so that's what we're all addicted to. The answer, the culprit, you know, you know, putting somebody in jail. You, you know, this is what happened on the news. Osama bin Laden did nine one one the first morning. They were blaming him. You know, well, there's, you know, it's it really isn't that fascinating to get an answer. So it's it's better to have a really good question than to have a poor answer to something. You know what I mean? Now that we've uh, discussed everything tonight, I want to go back uh, and put some of these pieces to the puzzle together for myself. You've been presented with images that look like, uh, oh, well, the carbon dating, 15,000 years old. Uh, that that represent different uh, all of the different gods and are, are represented in these photographs. Now that's fifteen thousand years old, and we have that gap that we're talking about in Giza. And the new documentary is called the New Atlantis, and this information coming out of Java is some of this starting to come together for you. And 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 was this a gift? Uh, your friend that sent you the. Uh, the images of these uh, of this treasure that was just found. Yes, and I well could have imagined that other treasures from Amarna would you know pop up somewhere, and we do have access to a lot of that stuff in museums. There's 900 pieces at the Metropolitan in New York, and 800 at the Brooklyn Museum. So that's 1,700 pieces from Amarna just in New York, mm -hmm. right? And so yes, this story. I mean, I feel very very comfortable with this story now, and uh, what they were up to. But the other thing is that. You know, I've been working with a composer. What would Atlantis? What what would Atlantis have sounded like? What kind of instruments? So they first started giving me instruments with keyboards. I'm like, uh, when was the piano invented? A thousand years ago. No keyboards, sorry. But they, we know they had brass and lots of different kinds of metals, and so there would have been horns, um, lots of percussion, their voices. But how would the voices have you know sounded? And so I've been working with um, you know different storyboards and the composer to try to elicit what the kind of music would have been, like Sundanese, whatever, and, 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 and you know, like the whole flamenco-esque kind of thing, and then what kind of animals would they have had? And, you know, if the Minoans were doing acrobatics on bulls and whatnot, you know, they talk about, Plato talks about uh, a racetrack around the exterior of the city. Well, how do we know that it wasn't like a, a circus with, 
you know, with acrobats and animals and, you know, and, and, you know, different, there's different things that have come to me that, and, and this has been a tough task. Like, how do I know what Atlanta sounded like? But because I'm, I use my, my, my senses as discernment when it's wrong, it's wrong. It's like, no, that's not it. And so there's been different, different trigger points. So now that we're listening to the music and we've got the footage and the whole thing and the animations, it's just, it's quite compelling. You know, how the hieroglyphic and the different symbols that you see over and over in, in Egypt, you know, is the heliosphere. This is the magnetosphere. This is the thing. This is the energy of the sun when you see Horus with the, I call them fallopian, t- fallopian tubes, but they also look like bullhorns, um, with this huge raging red sun. Well, that's the solar solar cycles, the solar flares. And so, you know, some of the animations are taking a real footage of solar flares and somehow blending it through the crown on his head to, to, you know, to just kind of give the idea that that's what they were representing. I mean, this is, this is, you'll see. I mean, it, it, it's the same style as the Pyramid Code um, in that, you know, there's animations, there's music, there's the narration, it all comes together, you know, things that you never thought of before, but, you well, know, okay. And it's not a tough sell, and I haven't had almost anybody say, you know, criticize it because it's laid out in a way that's kind of irrefutable. And what? You know, about, you can, and you mention uh, when you mention uh, the ceiling at Dendera, and I always think about one one of the things that blows my mind about Dendera's ceiling, uh, which goes back to Gobekli Tepe. In, in my eyes, there's a connection, and it's the zodiac, and the zodiac is there, and and it's it's obvious that it is you know the constellations, and the zodiac is there. And it's, I think it's also at uh, Gobekli Tepe. Going back to Java, is there evidence of the Zodiac, the modern version of the Zodiac that we see at Dendera and that we see at Gobekli Tepe? Is there evidence of that? Uh, is the progenitor of that co- going back to Java? Mm, coming up with a no on that, that doesn't mean it isn't. It just means that I didn't see it or find it. But that's that's okay, you know. Like the, you know, you go to different temples in Egypt, and they've got different stories with you know medical instrumentation in one and calendars in another, and different stories. So just because I didn't find it yet, you know, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But you find that over and over and over again in all the other places. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And so so the thing is, it's not going to be a hundred for a hundred, but it starts to lean toward the likelihood. But just the round zodiac at at Dendera that was copied by Napoleon and is in the Louvre and the fake ones at you know. That is actually the calendar of catastrophes, and it points directly to the last flood. And in the first hypostyle hall that's been cleaned now for three or four years, um, it has more details of exactly the point when the flood happened. But it's got all this information about wormholes and archetypes and, you know, and the zodiac and, 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 and. I mean, it is just resplendent with information. And it's teeny tiny, so... You know, and it's 40 feet up, right? So it's really so now with our high resolution cameras. You know, we we were working with a, uh, an image yesterday, 11,000 pixels across, right? Right. Like so, then you can really look at the detail, and that's when we're starting to go, oh, and all these things that fit together. You know, so so there's there's combinations of lots of different people's work, and then you start to see what the other guy was saying, and in, in, you know, and it's all oh, it's, it's terribly exciting, because after a while, it's all the same thing. With um, uh, a- after the pyramid code, has your what what's your has your dating changed on on the pyramids and and what's your best guesstimate when when they were built? I, I know it's an obvious question and you get asked this all the time, but uh, it, certainly twenty five hundred BC is out the door. Um, are you leaning on? You know the shock numbers of of ten thousand BC, eleven thousand five hundred well, BC. Well, I, I was at a on December twentieth, twenty twelve, in Giza. Uh, I was speaking at a conference, um, and he was showing how in this this year his date for the Sphinx was this, and the go then the next couple of years he made it older, and then the next couple of years he made it older, and um, you know that kind of shows that dates are slippery. Um, and I don't know that we, it, you know, that we can be completely accurate. I've been hovering, and Hakim, who's in the Pyramid Code, the Indigenous Wisdom Keeper, mm-hmm. 
I'm more comfortable with the date of 52,000. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a number that's... And then, then, then that shows how the Ptolemaic temples and, you know, even the Osirian at Abydos and uh, the temple to Seti the first that's on top of it, Dendera also has a temple underneath. The, you see the tops of the, the uh, columns of the lower temple. Right. So, and the one with, you know, the Seti the first and uh, the Osirian are, are, are above each other, but beside and above. So you can see them both at the same time, but at Dendera, you can't. And so um, there's a lot of things that were built on top of other things. At Amarna, no, there was just Nefertiti and Akhenaten, Akhenaten, and then and then that's it. That nothing else was there. But most everything else is got stuff built on top and top. And even at Giza, and that was in the pyramid code, that there was there likely would have been another structure where the second pyramid was, because the base is a different size. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So so. Um, it actually fits together that if there was a da- disaster at Atlantis and we were thinking about what to do to stabilize the planet, and it happened 58,000 years ago, that, you know, building pyramids somewhere, you know, in that relative vicinity of time may make sense. What is wrong with uh, Egyptologists and, and what is wrong with the idea that maybe you guys just inherited the pyramids. Maybe they were just there. Why are they fighting that? I mean, I don't understand what the big deal is. I, I really don't, because if we can just give in to that and start to investigate, then we start to answer uh, these big gaps in history and try to figure out our own past. Why do they insist on fighting this, Carmen? Well, it's it, wait a minute. This is the whole world. I wouldn't, you know, zero in just on Egypt. I mean, we everybody's kind of trying to toe the party line on everything. Right. And 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 academics, you know, this is the, this is you know what is the, our story, and we're sticking to it. But all of it is designed so we don't realize that we have empowerment and and abilities within ourselves for telepathy and levitation and bilocation and teleportation, a la Star Trek, everything. Right. You know, this is this is our birthright. This is something we can and should be able to do. And we've been dumbed down to the point where, you know, we're we're obsessing over you know, we're we're spectators and consumers and, and you know, and that's why shows like this are important for people who, who are still switched on and trying to come up with an answer. But maybe it's just easier that way. Uh, people feel threatened. Uh, they keep us consuming. They keep us giving us given. We give them their our money. We give them our attention, and they feed us back with the story of what is, whether it's true or not. You I would... mean, the dumbing down of people is is the biggest tragedy I can see. You would think that they would have all the funding that they needed, and all of the support and the excitement. Of, of this type of investigation, scientific work, that they, that it would be a great thing. I mean, you're right, for the entire world, but no. Instead, they just fight it, and they call you and I crazy. And I that doesn't well, get anybody funny, yeah. anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And the, funny, the thing is, the permits are all shut down. Like, the first page for the application for the Supreme Council of Antiquities is all archaeological digs are canceled from... Uh, Giza to Abu Simbel. I mean, uh, that pretty much covers the whole country. And then, <laughs> oh well, there's an exception for this or that. But I mean, they they they're just not not doing it. They're they're not they're not fine. There, there's an awful lot of Egypt that's still underground. That we know. And um, mostly it's about stopping credible research. And so there are other countries in the world that are a little bit more open to real research, and that's where. Klaus Donna is working with his scans other places in the world where he can get the cooperation of the government to go and do these digs that go tens of meters deep, you know, and take months and months and months of digging to get there. But they know there's something way down, 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 which will make it old because in archaeology, older is deeper. Let's take a quick break. Our guest tonight, the fabulous Dr. Carmen Bolter. Always great when she's on with us. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. More with Carmen right after this short break. Stay right there. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. 
If your home has hard water and it's leaving white spots, then it's likely that LimeScale is clogging your pipes. LimeScale can cost hundreds of dollars a year in wasted energy and early appliance breakdown. HydroCare systems available at Wave Home Solutions prevent and remove LimeScale with just a simple filter change every three years. There are no salts, chemicals, or magnetic coils. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, just go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. If you're a talk radio fan, accessradio.net lets you listen to the best talk shows anytime and from anywhere. Works on your mobile or landline phone, and there's no cost if you have unlimited minutes. No need to use your data. Find your favorite talk show listen lines and discover new ones. Now you can listen on your schedule. Go to accessradio.net. That's accessradio.net. Save your favorite listen lines today. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Dr. Carmen Bolter. We're discussing all things lost civilizations, Egypt, pyramids, her original series, The Pyramid Code, her new series, which is The New Atlantis. I've got a bunch of questions lined up here that have come in in Twitter, Carmen, and we're going to address those in a second. But I wanted to ask you, do you know uh, uh, Jacques Doubleday? No. Okay. Uh, I got an email from him. He's the uh, he says he's the official videographer uh, for the uh, for the Bosnian pyramids, and he's been filming out there uh, 2005 to 2013. And he sent me a bunch of stuff now, um, and so I, I've got that stuff, you know, coming from him. And I speak to you about the Bosnian pyramids, and then I've had you know Robert Shock on the show a couple of times, and I respect Robert. I think we all do. And and his take on the Bosnian pyramids, and I'm caught in the middle. I, again, I haven't been there, but what? I, and I always ask for your gut because I trust you. You nobody knows more about pyramids than you. So when you see Bosnian, uh, the Bosnian pyramids, what do they actually tell you? Are you do you feel good about that, or are you are you riding on faith? I mean, wh- what do you, what's your take on Bosnia? Well, I consider Dr. Sam Osmanagic to be the best researcher and scientifically oriented person, and it is the biggest, most successful archaeological dig on the planet. 
And so I've got nothing but praise for the work he's doing. And um, just like we were mentioning in Egypt, I used to call Dr. Sam Dr. Yes and Zahi Dr. No, right? Because right. everything was no, no, no in Egypt. And Dr. Sam says yes to everybody collecting debt, any respectable card-carrying, you know, academic, geologist, whatever, to do research there. Now, I filmed for the New Atlantis there, and um, they took us into the tunnel system. Um, now, the tunnel system's in between three pyramids. It's not underneath the one pyramid, and when you go into the entrance, you can see. And that's the issue that some people have, that he claims that they're under the pyramid, but really they're over beside, so he's lying. It's like, well, if you go there, he obviously knows where the door is and where the pyramid is. They're not underneath. He never said they were underneath, but we assume. Just the way there's passageways all around the Giza Plateau, everywhere. Anyway, so... So I was filming in there, and uh, I didn't bring my water bottle. I'm on a shoot. I can't hold everything. We had to wear hard hats down there, and you know. And then I, you know, we were in there for several hours, and um, and then I started to feel like dehydrated, and my kidneys were seizing up, and I started feeling exhausted, and the camera was so heavy. And then we went into this room that they've measured up to 14,000 times uh, the, the regular ions that you normally would negative ions that you would have in any other place. And there's this crystal, pure water. And all of a sudden, I felt like the pressure come off my kidneys. I felt like, you know, young and strong. And the camera weighed half as much as it did five minutes ago. I'm like, what is this place? You know? And he started to explain, you know, what it was used for. And the other thing is that we went to their museum and lab. And uh, Timothy Moon, who's the head archaeologist, I'm, I'm filming him. And he's, look what I found yesterday. I've called her Medusa, which is one of the chapters in my book. I nearly dropped the camera. So this is like Stone Age, matriarchal meets pyramid. I mean, like, I mean, for me, with those two big circles that didn't necessarily seem related, it all came together right there. And I am more than impressed. And I'm going to tell you something else. You mentioned Michael Tillinger. I also filmed there. And uh, he's got a museum. And if I showed you footage panning Michael Tillinger's museum, and then I showed you footage, which I will do, panning uh, the lab at the Bosnian pyramids, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two because of what they're finding. It's the hmm. same. Hmm. Well, South Africa is not in the neighborhood of Bosnia. Right, right, now, right. They haven't opened the pyramid yet because they don't want to do a forced entry. And the entry isn't obvious. The entrance to the tunnel system was found by the same scan as Klaus Donna have been mentioning. We did Hawara and uh, where he is now, a lot of other places. And so um, I think it's as real as real can be. I've seen the carbon-14 dating certificates with my own eyes. Um, they, I've, you know, gone up to the, the you know, to very, you know, I've filmed it. I've been there, done that. So um, it's, it's really real. It's um, scientifically proven, uh, the, but the thing is, is that when the government gave Dr. Sam the responsibility and right to do what he's doing, they said, you will never see this acknowledged on mainstream media. And so a lot of people say, well, if it isn't on TV, it's not true. And so basically that's, that's the conditions that he's working with, is that it's going to be denied. And I think that's why, without going there, it's hard to tell and it seems far-fetched. And why are there trees growing on a pyramid? Because it was built before the flood. And when the flood receded, it left silt, which was fertile enough to grow things. And it doesn't look like a pyramid from a distance necessarily because the trees are all different heights. So if you could, you know, get a helicopter and turn them all like with a hedge trimmer, you would see that it's this absolutely straight-sided pyramid. What evidence is there of any culture that could, I mean, you're talking about manpower, and if it if we're going back to the flood era, I mean, what culture was there uh, that long ago? I mean, is there any evidence that anybody lived there at all? Well, yes. It's, the thing is, is that this is on the telluric currents of the Earth, and it would have been one of the colonization sites from the Atlanteans who were trying to save and stabilize the planet. Okay. So they would have come from far and wide. They all have the same techniques. The, the pyramids are all built largely the same with various chambers, of, you know, different angles. So it's like a harmonic. Uh, they all have water underneath. They all have a network of passageways. There's like, you know, they have energy beams coming out of the top that can be measured that get stronger the farther away you get. 
you know, there's all kinds of things that um, for a functional pyramid, it has to have seven characteristics, as does the new Valery Uvarov pyramid, and as does the Bosnian and many others. But they're popping up all over the place, they're, you know, Serbia, and they're all over the place now. Is the uh, is the basic the basic uh, design of the pyramids not only in Mexico and China and and uh, in Giza and certainly Bosnia too as well uh, the same basic uh, construction right we're talking four sides uh, square at the base um, and the same basic height too as well uh, they're all basically the same geometry. Well, no, they're all different angles. And so, you know, you get the 51, 51, right. or the second pyramid, 53, 51, 52, you know, so the Dashur seems a little bit more splayed, but that, and the bent pyramid has two angles. But that was all about harmonics, so the chambers are positioned in different places. But if you were thinking about huge resonance fields, and almost like a wind harp, you know, or, or wind chime, or what do you call those... Um, it's, well, I guess a wind harp, the wind blows through almost like you're blowing into a flute, and then they, they end up resonating. So each of them has like a different note, or they harmonize with each other. And they're all connected to star maps as well. We find that over and over again. And so there, there, there's characteristic features, but they're not all exactly the same, and they're not all exactly the same size either. But, you know, Valerie will tell you that, that that's not what matters. This is what matters. It's, it's the double helix of quartz. Hmm. under pressure it's the orientation it's it's the, there's different things that matter that we have lost our focus on angle is not one of them do you think uh that there's a possibility now this is look i don't have a phd or any three letter anything after my name so uh please respect me for asking such a dumb question but do you think that the Red Pyramid and the Step Pyramid and the other pyramids, uh, 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 excluding the Gray Pyramid, that those could have been built after the Gray Pyramid and the, they were trying to imitate and duplicate the Gray Pyramid and just didn't succeed? No, and that's what they say about the Bent Pyramid, that they, they didn't know how to do it and then they changed their mind and put another angle. That's in the Pyramid Code. No, I think that the network is very, very deliberate and that the, the sequence of where the pyramids are placed are telling us something. So from, you know, from Abu Roush to Dashur, this is also going to be in the New Atlantis. It's right reflecting the extra galactic grid. Goes, you know, if you keep going, like Cygnus is Dashur, and I've worked all this out in Starry Night Pro, so the, the, the extra galactic grid goes right up the spine, through the tail, out the nose of the, of the bird, and the next thing you hit is the um, galactic center, and then it comes back around to Isis slash Sirius at Abu Roush, and it's a highly, highly sophisticated arrangement that stays together all the way back to 50,000 BC and all the way forward to 13,000 AD. Mm -hmm. And I haven't figured out what Saqqara is, which is why I haven't published it, and I'm not sure if I'll find it, but I am going to go for it, because everything you put in that doesn't work it, it doesn't hold the configuration when you go back in time so it's not part of that arrangement and so i don't think it's haphazard now they try to say that the step pyramid is the oldest and it's made out of these little bricks so i i don't have any information that it's the oldest but it's a step pyramid so step pyramids can be tombs and they found grave goods in there the other pyramids are more like machines you know like the inside of your oven sort of thing right right and so uh, no, I don't think it's copycat stuff. Now, there is some copycat stuff at Pyramids in Mexico where they didn't have the alignments correct, and John Burke had brought us that, that they were charging seeds, and they, the seeds from the fake pyramids wouldn't charge. So, yes, pyramids have been copied, but not that much. Now, when, um, when, we, have, when we have this to chew on, which is... Uh, the leveling of the limestone uh, bedrock in uh, underneath the Great Pyramid. You have the 130 red granite blocks that they towed, you know, 500 miles, and some of them weighing up to 70 tons, and then hauled up 200 feet to the king's chamber. We got to wrap our mind around that. 
that you had the 300 foot passageways that were cut through too as well. And of course, two and a half million pieces of stone that were different shapes and sizes. The King's chamber uh, being built to that kind of precision blows my mind. Uh, it, pointing to North within 500th of a degree. Um, it's got eight sides instead of, instead of four that I can't digest either as well for stone age, man. That's pretty incredible. And, to say that they did all of that with copper chisels and stone balls and, and hemp ropes, I don't buy into that either. But let's say all of that is true and it all really happened at 2500 B.C. Where is the evidence of the uh, the copper chisels? Wouldn't there be, after two hundred uh, 2.4 million rocks, isn't there... Five million stone chisels. I mean, the copper chisels buried in the ground somewhere. You know, where there's are... actually three in the museum, and they're literally chisels. Uh, actually, John, no, sorry, David Serrata, uh came up with a reason why that uh, the angle the angle was in a few degrees. It's actually functional. They actually did it on purpose, and it had a yeah, it had a, a purpose to it. So it's not that they made a mistake, right? And. Um, yeah, so the thing is, when we say Stone Age men, we think of the primitive guy with the club dragging his woman around by her hair. And that's just not the picture of the ancients. That's something that's been repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, which is what they do. They do propaganda, 911, you know, uh, you know, terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. They, they, if they repeat something often enough, you end up going, oh, whatever, I'm not going to argue with that. Right. And so that's just not what it was at all. And there's a Japanese team that tried to float blocks on barges from a swan and bring them and, and lift them. And it took them a huge amount of time to um, build a 13 stone little capstone, not even as big as a capstone. It's all you made them take it down because all their, the technique just didn't work. They couldn't do it. And so, um, yeah. And, and even, you know, I don't think the stones came from a swan. I don't. Um, I do think that they that there was a completely different technology going on. I don't think it took, you know, thousands of people 20 years or whatever. Um, I, I think that they had technology that made it not easy, but certainly not the way we do things. The You don't think the red granite came from a swan? No. Where would it have? And I don't think the obelisks are done when you go to the granite quarry. And they've got the unfinished obelisk. I don't think that's how they did it either. I think somebody went there and surmised what they did and tell everybody that's what they did. And it's like they put little wood things. They make chisel marks and they put wood in. And then they wet the wood and the wood expands. And right. the stone cracks. Well, that's just far more precise than that. <laughs> when I look at that, uh, the unfinished obelisk, and I, and I look at that uh, and, and think about Doing that with those flat surfaces and those angles with with stone balls, I, I just have to just. I, it sounds weird to say stone balls. It's I apologize. Not it. It's just not it it's, at all. No, it's impossible. Is what it is. It's impossible. It, it just can't happen. I can't. Well, the bottom line here is that the Egyptians would have taken the pyramids down. We don't have the technology to take them down. Have you ever? I talked about this a couple of years ago on the show, and this is where I get the mad respect uh, uh, for for uh, megaliths. Have you ever tried to cut a stone block yourself? Have you ever tried like a red brick in your backyard, Carmen, right, and get a stone chisel from Home Depot, right, to, to cut your bricks so you can do a little brick work in your backyard? Have you ever done that? Have you ever tried yeah. to cut a brick? Well, I have a water feature that's a, a, a face that's about two feet high, a goddess. And uh, it actually was a sculpture, and I was trying to turn it into a water feature. So we had to drill five holes through the top of the the, the hair. Did it happen? So the water goes down her face. Did it, it, was, ha it took all day to drill five <laughs> tiny holes. I got to tell you, I cut... I had a I had a wheelbarrow full of bricks, right? And all I needed was one brick, one size. And you know, every single one, you know, you mess it up, you mess it up, you mess it up, you mess it up. I'm just thinking how did the, you really get a newfound respect for how they got that done because I couldn't cut one brick to the size that I needed to fit so it would turn a corner in my backyard. <laughs> I just couldn't There's do it. There's a stone in the Valley Temple that has 11 different faces on it. One stone. 
exactly. that sit in the corner around the door and go over, you know, <laughs> there's, it's no, there's no way it was done the way we're doing things. And now, and I know you miss Hakeem. What, when, when you discuss this with him, I mean, uh, did he, did he give you the secret knowledge? Did he tell you how they actually pulled this off? No, but I have to tell you this. I saw him the other day. Um, I have a suite, and we came back from a film shoot, and we looked through. The, one of my crew looked through the window, and the tenants were watching the Pyramid Code, and Hakeem was in the suite. <laughs> <laughs> say, so I got a real kick out of that. Say what? Say that again? Well, just that he was on TV, and we could see through the window that it was Hakeem in the suite because oh. the tenants were watching the Pyramid Code. Oh, I get you. I get you. out of that. Um, <clears throat> And yes, I miss him very, very much. Um, uh, he understood some secrets. There's no question about it. And has he passed it on to his son? Well, the children weren't that interested in his work. Like, I I was with him every day that I was in Egypt when I didn't have a group for 10 years. And, it, you know, they'd come and bring him tea and, you know, do things for him, but they weren't really interested in his work. So, yes, I think that... Um, one of them is, 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 is more in contact with him from the other side and getting some information and some wisdom. But it wasn't that direct, and Hakeem wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't share anything unless he already knew. He was a pretty tough Zen taskmaster, if you ask me. So if I said, well, tell me all about this, he didn't know. But if I came back and said, well, Nefertiti and Hanan, I don't know where they this and this, and then he'd go, yes, and then he wouldn't shut up for three days. Right, right. But he, wouldn't, he wouldn't even start if I didn't already know, and I've watched that where we're having a certain kind of discussion and somebody who doesn't understand comes in the room and it turns into word salad. So if you don't have the consciousness to receive him, you ain't gotten, you're not getting anything but, you know, a nice afternoon tea with him. Uh, just, oh, 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 okay. I have a couple of uh, quick questions I want to get out of the way and then uh, we'll wrap this up. And again, thank you so much. Always great having you on. Um, is there... Is there evidence, uh, what do you think about a fourth pyramid on the Giza Plateau? And is there something under the sand? Well, no. Hakeem would tell you that, because he lived there his whole life, right? And his house is right there looking at it. So, right. That there was a, another pyramid there. Um, and when they used it as an open quarry, I don't know what made it different, but they were able to take all this, the stones and they ended up building mosques and all kinds of things in Cairo out of the stones from the pyramid that they dismantled. Now, I don't know how they did that. It probably wasn't as big as the Great Pyramid, but he, Hakeem will tell you that there was another pyramid there. Not that it's buried, that it's just gone. Right. And so the uh, the bedrock for that uh, would just be under a few feet of sand then, or, or 10 feet or whatever. Well, we don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And uh, Dennis just said, uh, this is in Twitter, he says, the Indiegogo is over, but can you please ask Carmen if she's still accepting donations somewhere else? Oh, thank you very much. I'll put something on my website um, in the next day or two where you can contribute, and I appreciate that very much, because we, we are short to finish, and that's slowing us down, so it would be really good if we could get some help with the final editing. And what, what's uh, the timetable looking like now? The uh, release date? July. And okay. I'm sticking to that. It may take longer, but I'm really, uh, you know, we're going to dance as fast as we can on the way to July because it's been, you know, it's, it's time. It's time. We've got the pieces. It's just a question of, you know, baking the cake now that we've got the ingredients. Who did the music? Uh, well, one of my favorite parts about the Pyramid Code is is the music. Uh, how did you get well, that I done? Did, I did think I was going to work with uh, Michael Damon, and uh, I think he nailed the Pyramid Code music fantastically. And when I pitched the New Atlantis, it was coming back more. I said, I do not want it to be Pyramid Code-esque. It can't sound the same. And so it didn't work. So I'm working with a man named Coco Berjo. I'm not pronouncing his last name right, out of New Jersey. And he works, he's got his own sound studio, and he works with jazz musicians and whatnot in New York. He's very talented. And as I said, he delivered 14 tracks to me yesterday, a final, final pieces that we've been working on together. And who's narrating? I'm uh, looking at Sally Jennings still, the same narration. Mm. Um, for continuity, everybody liked her, mm. and she's very easy to work with. And she's here, though we do have a couple of other people who are pitching to me that they would like to be considered. So 
that's the you know one of the last things that happens. No, nah, she's great. I mean, she's, she's great. great. No, she, I, I, you know, but the thing is, is she she she's trained as an actor herself, right? And as a voice coach. And, you know, when we went to do um, some of the recording, we the, the guy had the studio for the whole night, and we went out and did the first take, and, and we packed up our things. He goes, where are you going? I said, well, we're done. He goes, you only did one cut, one take. He goes, it's, it's fine. It's perfect? Yes, it's Sally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she's such a, 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 a part of, she's like the fourth pyramid, if you know what I mean. I mean, she's like the fifth beetle, right? She's well, such a part. Owner and tell her that. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm saying. She's such a big part of 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 the original series. Now, are you going to? Is this going to be five one hour episodes? Yep. Okay. All right. It's I'm excited. Sequel, we're already talking to the sequel office of Netflix. And I got one last question: Are you speaking anywhere soon? Oh yeah, Global Pyramid Conference May the weekend of the May 12th and 13th, whatever the weekend is there, um, in Chicago. And Dr. Sam and Valerie Uroff will be there, and I'm terribly excited, and I'll interview them both there. Um, and so there's 14 speakers, and uh, Marta Thomas has put this conference together, and Bruce Cunningham will be there who organized the Java trip. And so th this will be good, really good. Thank you so much, Global Carmen. Pyramid Conference. Isn't that something? Thank you so much. And all of that is on uh, pyramidcode.com. Of course, we yes. have... The links to PyramidCode.com and JimmyChurchRadio.com. Just click on Carmen's name. It'll take you it's a, straight It's there. a little out of date. I'll, I'll be updating it in the next day or two, but um, we've just got a lot on the go. But, uh, yeah. yes, eventually when you go back to that site, you'll find that information. You're absolutely uh, super, super busy. We understand that. Thank you so much. I had a great conversation tonight, and I have the feeling we're going to have you on in about a month as this other stuff uh, starts to surface. And thank you for sharing all of that with I'll, us tonight. I'll be sure to let you know, Jimmy. You got it. Thank you so much, Carmen. Have a great, safe night and keep rolling that rock literally uphill. Okay. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Good night. <laughs> thank you. Carmen Bolter, everybody. Now, uh, I tried to get to everybody's questions in Twitter, um, but, uh, and I tried to get everything in, but what uh, uh, a bunch of revelations tonight. She's, She's just uh, somebody that when, when I discuss uh, with her, all I want to do is ask those questions. I just want to learn. And she does that for me every single time she's on the show. So I know that you shared all of that with me. And I want to thank uh, Carmen Bolter for coming on tonight. And so I'm going to take a quick break. And uh, I have a couple of your questions here that I can answer myself that I didn't get to. This is Fade to Black. I'll open up the phone lines when I come back after this short break. 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, taking your calls and all of the news that you know nothing about right after this short break. Stay right there. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Angioprim can clean blocked arteries and improve blood flow in all parts of your body. Angioprim is liquid oral chelation. It's not new science. 50 years of research has gone into chelation and now there's Angioprim. Easy, simple, liquid oral chelation. You take it with juice before breakfast and forget about it. Angioprim works fast, unlike old-fashioned chelation that takes hours. The first thing Angioprim users say is they have more energy, more strength, more endurance. Increased circulation and blood flow will make all your body parts work better. 
better. Log on now at angioprim.com to get more information on how you can get started and start feeling better and doing more. Lots more. Talk to a trained Angioprim consultant or go to angioprim.com for help. Call Angioprim toll free at 877-882-7221. That's Angioprim at 877-882-7221. Get the facts about Angioprim. Begin living the life you want doing the things you used to do again with Angioprim. Hello, Fader Knots. Are you looking for the ultimate Bluetooth speaker system? Well, check this out. The Studio Dome surround sound system featuring the Studio Dome 1 SD1 and the Studio Boombox SBB wireless Bluetooth speakers is the perfect way to get surround sound without all of the cable headaches. With its own hard shell custom carrying case for taking your surround sound experience on the go. Each hard shell case comes packed with an SBB, two SD1s, cables, and power. It's just 99 bucks, And you use the promo code Jimmy and you get yourself some free shipping. Once again, Studio Dome brings you the best deal on the net anywhere. Just go to the Studio Dome banner, JimmyChurchRadio.com, promo code Jimmy, go Beckley Tappy. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back to Fade to Black. Opening up the phone lines right now, 323-825-5045. I'm going to talk me some Egypt. I really do. 323-825-5045. What do you think? You know, do you go with the dogma that has been stuffed down our throats forever about Egypt and about the pyramids? You know, uh, Carmen has been there, right? She's been there. She's walked around. She's touched. She's photographed, videoed, uh, did one of the most successful documentary series, uh, The Pyramid Code, on Egypt ever. You know, uh, her and John Anthony West. It, it, those, if you if you can set aside a weekend and do The Pyramid Code and uh, and John Anthony West nine part series, do those back to back to back to back. You'll you'll walk around acting like you know something, seriously. Now, but the the dogma, right? That forty seven hundred years ago, five thousand years ago, the Egyptians leveled a limestone hill the size of six soccer fields, piled up two point four, two point five million rocks all of different shapes and sizes, not even consistent, to the height of a 42-story building, right? <laughs> Carved 300 utterly straight, 300-foot uh, tunnels into a granite chamber, red granite, that they brought 500 miles from Aswan. To, uh, and, and aligned everything perfectly to magnetic north made it all earthquake proof, made it eight sided with copper chisels and stone hammers. Right. You know, and this is a crazy thing that that's, that's what they want us to believe. And we just know that it just didn't happen that way. I don't care who you are. Come on this show. Let's go. Let's debate. Let's go toe to toe. I'll put the gloves on, but now we nearly have, and that that's the, that's the story that we have been told uh, for a hundred years, right now, now today, we nearly have the same set of issues with Gobekli Tepe and it's 6,000 years older. So you can't have it both ways. You cannot is Gobekli Tepe is big. You know what? It's as crazily complex and nearly as big 
It's over, you know, it, they, there's 25 of those stone circles there now built over 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years. And they're beautiful and they're complex. And it's 6,000 years older. It's the same set of problems. Carving those stones, transporting those stones, getting them upright, getting them to fit together. Those stone circles are complex. Those T pillars are amazing. And it's 6,000 years older. So you cannot sit here and tell me that it all started at Giza 4,700 years ago because it did not. End of story. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hello? Yeah, you're live right now. You're oh, on the wow. air. <laughs> this is my first time calling in, Jimmy. And what's your name? It's Cassandra. Hi, Cassandra. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I am fantastic. Did you enjoy the show tonight? Oh, my gosh, yes. I came in right as she started. Um, and uh, actually, this is my first time finally calling in live. Uh, last week, I called in to uh, Jeff Harmon and on Friday, but you did your show on Thursday, and I kept calling and calling. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. ringing, ringing, ringing. <laughs> yeah, the studio was closed, Cassandra. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, so now I'm, now I'm on it. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, I was totally tripping out with how she was going on about – all the different pyramids in different places, and the, and I was wondering, and maybe she already alluded to this, that the pyramids were created to create a magnetic force to keep the Earth from falling apart, and to keep, and to like, like those parts. I don't, I don't know, because I've heard theories that all those lands used to be one big land space, mm -hmm. and that maybe, maybe the pyramids were created to kind of ground the people on the land as they split. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's interesting. Almost like they floated off like ships from each other. And yeah, so I just, that was kind of a funky image I had while you guys were talking. Well, but see, what you're suggesting here is is not that far-fetched. And, and and let me explain why. And then I want to hear your comment on this, okay? And, and if you have an aha moment right now with me on the air, just enjoy it, okay? But, okay. But, but it's this. Continental drift was an, and shift was a concept that didn't get accepted. Now it is. But until the 1950s, 1950s, 60 oh, wow. years ago. So uh, th that uh, that idea time, time when they were creating propaganda, right? <laughs> well, but yes, yes, yes. And if you think about this, the concept of it, because I remember looking at a globe when I was probably 10, 11 years old. I'm looking at the globe and and I'm looking at the different land shapes and I'm just like, hey. All of these things kind of fit together, you know, and I'm kind of spinning the globe around and and imagining this. Oh, and yeah. I remember going to my teacher in fifth grade, sixth grade, fifth grade, asking, hey, does it look like uh, uh, South America and Africa, you know, fit together once and maybe floated apart? No, nah, no, nah, you know, it's an idea, but nah, probably not. And, and I was like, well, I don't know, man. You know, <laughs> if you kind of look, you know, and then I'd spin the globe around and I'm looking at, you know, uh, you can see Greenland and Europe and everything and and uh, Australia. You can just fit it all together. You can. So now now pretty much that is the accepted uh, idea here that everything was all one and then it just pulled apart. Right. OK. So now yeah. if we if we if we accept that idea and most do now today. If you accept that, then you don't have. And the problem is, Cassandra, if you think about what uh, uh, the the idea of people having boats, you know, 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, that could span the oceans to communicate with each other, right, to share knowledge, to mm -hmm. to migrate and so forth that they may not have had that technology. Okay, well, you know what? But maybe they didn't need it because maybe everything was connected at one point. 
And so if you start to put all of these land masses together, they didn't have to go across water. They had to cross the street. You know, they only had yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and so it's not that far-fetched anymore. When we're talking about transoceanic cultures, that's only if you think about the way that the Earth sits right now. But 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, uh, let's, you know, let's go far back at when this this it was a different world and, and things were connected and there were land bridges and land masses. We didn't have, you know, 5000 miles of ocean water in between these cultures that actually that uh, there were land bridges and they were probably even connected and touching and they hadn't broken apart yet. And, and I, I oh sorry. Yeah, no. That now, now when you suggest the uh, not only you but Carmen that these cultures certainly at a, a, a pre-Atlantean or Atlantean, uh, post-Atlantean, pre-Atlantean, both that these cultures shared their knowledge and went out and migrated around the world, and they took that knowledge with them for the construction of the pyramids. Um, for whatever reason, for her, it was pole shift, right? That we, we had a pole flip and, and North mm -hmm. went South and South went North and it was cataclysmic and they wanted to prevent that. And the way to, to prevent that, and it's a good theory. It's a good idea was to magnetically connect and electrically connect, uh, pyramids around the world to, uh, at different locations to prevent another pole shift and something cataclysmic great idea nothing wrong with it and the reason why i don't have an issue with that is today our entertainment is television right we go to the movies mm -hmm. we have our cell phones we have our tablets uh and and so forth uh nothing wrong with that but ten thousand years ago fifteen thousand years ago five thousand years ago fifty thousand years ago you know what we had we had our minds Oh, and, yeah. and that's what we advanced. And that's when we talk about, uh, uh, she brought up teleportation, but how about just telekinesis or the power of the mind? Telepathy. Telepathy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, astral projections and so forth. That's because we, 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 we worked on the mind and we worked on the self. We weren't worried about the next episode of the Kardashians. You know, we worked, <laughs> right. right? You follow me? Which I think my neighbor might be listening to. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. And, and, and now and when you start to look at things in those terms, I don't know about you, but it starts to make sense to me. And those questions start to get answered. Uh-huh. Well, I had a couple of rel revelatory things come up as you were talking. Um, First of all, I thought, you know, if if we can still piece together the different pieces of the world now so easily, maybe there was a shift that split them apart quickly because there wasn't enough time to erode the areas enough from each other. Does that make sense? Sure, it does. Like, like splitting apart a puzzle um, piece by piece as opposed to putting it together. And also, I was thinking when you were talking about all the – pyramids being in different places let's say they were what if they were originally all in the same place knowing because you know they have telepathy telekinesis everything they could maybe remote view into the future and see that the land mass is going to shift during the pole shift into continental shifts all quickly so maybe the pyramids were created ahead of time as land ships for people to be in and then be safe in and they didn't maybe they didn't know how much they were going to split apart from each other but but it was a way to help keep them alive yeah protect especially them pyramid, yeah especially since pyramids can be used for energy uh healing pa, uh, again I, I, you know and and this is what's funny and and that is a great great way of looking at things and and this is what's really funny go with me on this we oh. don't know nothing. <laughs> right? We we right. know absolutely nothing. And for right. anybody to say that they know definitively on how this was done and how the you know what? None of us were there. 
Okay. Yeah. There, there's no evidence. There's no, there's just nothing that there's nothing. And, and except, that's, I'm sorry, except go ahead. Except, except now we're evolving. So maybe we are getting some of our history back through telepathical uh, recall, so to speak. Yeah, yeah that, that's possible. And and that's entirely possible. What what I do know is that we are, like you just said, we're evolving and we're maturing. And with mm-hmm. that, we're starting to realize that everything that we have been taught is BS. <laughs> we're, <Yeah. laughs> we're, we're getting smarter now. And we just know, right. you know, when you know, when you know, when you have that moment when you look at your mom and dad and go, OK, we got to talk about the Santa Claus thing. Right. OK. Right. I've been buying yeah. it for a while now, but the chimney thing all around the world in one night, I just OK. Can we talk? Well, that's where yeah. we're at now with with lost civilizations and ancient history. That's a brilliant analogy. Well, no, yeah. it's, it's really true. It's like we're, we're smart enough now to know that uh, I want to use bad language here and I'm not going to. But we know that it's all B.S. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and we're starting to figure it out on our own. And it does take researchers like Robert Schock and Carmen Bolter and, and, and Graham Hancock and Robert Baval, um, uh, John Anthony West. The, uh, the, 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 the names are long, but those people uh, have been called alternative history theorists. You know, they're alternative. They're outside mm-hmm. like it's a bad word. And now we're starting to find out that most of them are absolutely right, you know, wow. and, and that's what it takes right now. It's that that whole alternative side of things is turning out mm-hmm. to be the mainstream. And we're it's only because we're smart enough to know that there uh, the Santa Claus thing is is not the real story, you know, and, yeah. and that's that's my take. And I'm sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> you said you had another re- uh, revelation tonight. What was it? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm personally trying to suck up as much about time travel and, and all that as, as possible and maybe incorporate it somehow into a story. And, oh, it's so mind boggling. And I think you interviewed a guy that interviewed a guy. He like spent like some crazy amount of hours with him. I can't remember his name. Oh, you're talking um, about Michael Holtzinger, and uh, you're talking about Al Bielik. Yes, yes, and Al Bielik had gone to, like, the year 2156 or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, one thing that's really trippy is that I had a dream before I heard that interview, and the year was 2156, <laughs> and it was, like, um, apocalyptic, and it was, you know, like – no, as if EMS, as if, you know, anyway, long story short, you mentioning something about time. I was remembering when she said something about crystal and I don't know what she was describing. I got a little confused because I'm still learning a lot of new stuff that you guys have a common language about. Um, I remember in the Bielik story about um, the, the importance of a crystal in that era or vice versa that people from that era were trying to get him to bring back a crystal. Do you remember that? I I do. I don't remember the specifics on that, though. But what was your question about it? Well, I just uh, I I was wondering if there was a connection with the use of crystal as a protective energy because it's so powerful. And, you know, we probably have barely scratched the surface with what we can do with it. I mean, we meaning the average lay person as opposed to people that have probably spent half their life on it. Yeah. Um, I, and... I, I have, I have uh, done a little research on crystals. Um, I, I have uh, a couple here in the studio. I've got a crystal skull. I've got a crystal pyramid wow. um, and stuff and, and, and charging of crystals and what they do and, and how to tune your body and your chakras with them. I haven't done any of that myself, but there is tons and tons and tons of research out there about it. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 when it comes to knowledge like that, I always look at it like this, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's way too much Mm -hmm. knowledge and research that goes into this. 
Have I mm-hmm. practiced it myself? No. Many guests have, have, have been on the show, and we've talked about that extensively. Um, I, 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 um, I'm comfortable enough to have a crystal skull sitting here staring at me in yeah, the studio. Yeah, that's brave of you. Yeah. I'm a little yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but thank you uh, for being, A, yeah, cor- courageous enough absolutely. to call into the show. And it's, it's a really good thing. And welcome to the family, Cassandra. You should jump. Thank you. Have you jumped over am to I, Twitter? Am I an official fade or not now? <laughs> yeah, you are. You've, you've, you've uh, put your toes in the water. Uh, have, awesome. I haven't figured out the Twitter thing yet, but <laughs> okay. get on Twitter and come hang out with us tomorrow night. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Thank you so much, Cassandra. There you go. First time caller. Love it. Absolutely love it. Okay. Before uh, phone lines are open, I, I want to get back to uh, some of the news that has been breaking and uh, where was I with it? Uh, here we go. Bookings from would-be space tourists planning to fly with Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic Limited have recovered almost to the level seen before the fatal breakup of its Spaceship Two rocket plane back in October 2014. Um, Oh, man. Somewhere, uh, Rita, somewhere we have pictures of me with uh, Spaceship One out at the Mojave Desert. Uh, We took a bunch of pictures. I went out there and uh, uh, was able to go out with uh, the Virgin Galactic crew. They took me out onto the runway there, and I took a bunch of pictures. And we have them somewhere. I need to pull those up. We need to post those. Those were taken back in like 2008. But uh, anyway, uh, I was just thinking out loud. About 25 of the 700 fee-paying clients, they had 700 that signed up and paid in advance, 25 withdrew from the program after the crash in the Mojave Desert uh, that caused the entire project to be put on hold uh, just months before the first commercial flight. Some of these were refunded and their deposits and so forth after the crash, but they have asked for their tickets back. It looks like the replacement uh, plane is about ready to go and it is advancing, but that is really good news. Um, and yes, check this out. Go with me. Uh, Rita just said, I don't know where those are. I wasn't alive in 2008. Uh, thank you for that, Rita. Um, yes, it was actually 50 years ago. And now a conference is being held this weekend to recall a time of unusual lights, floating discs, and other alleged UFOs in southern Michigan. Yeah. In March 1966, students at Hillsdale College reported a UFO had landed in a softball field. And if you remember, uh, Gerald Ford was, I think he was governor, right? Wasn't he governor of Michigan when all of this started to go down? And then in another incident at Washtenaw County, police rush to a wetlands area after being told of an eerily glowing floating disc. And the Air Force determined that it was an illusion related to, wait for it, swamp gas. The anniversary is here. The Swamp Gas Anniversary. I can't believe it. March 1966. And uh, and no swamp gas before then, by the way. Yeah. Kicked off. So this weekend is the anniversary. Uh, Neanderthal, Neanderthals. I almost said thals. Neanderthals ate a diet consisting of, are you ready? Are you ready? red meat. Yeah, that's right. 20% plant-based food. And this is according to a new Associated Studies that analyzed skeletons of early humans from Europe and Asia. The findings support earlier research that at least some paleo diets relied heavily on red meat, including some fruits, vegetables, and other plant materials, and were mostly, if not completely, devoid of seafood. 
80% red meat. The latest studies are published right now in the Journal of Human Evolution and the Journal Quaternary International. Uh, where am I? Okay. This is where I get angry. Oh, man. I'm inflamed. Amy Poehler. There is a new trend going on in Beverly Hills, Malibu, Southern California. Amy friggin' Poehler. Yeah, she's funny. But check this out. She was charged more than $2,200 for using more than 170,000 gallons of water between May and July of last year to water her lawn. 170,000 gallons of water. Now, for comparison, the average Los Angeles family uses around 13,000 gallons of water per month. As a result, right now, the city's excessive water consumption state regulators fined Beverly Hills last year the city subsequently sent letters to various culprits, urging them to reduce their high water use. Now, if you're not here in Southern California and the news about this, you drive around Beverly Hills, go around Malibu, and you look at these estates. Yeah, they're rich and they can afford to pay the water bill. But you look at these huge lawns and trees and fruit trees and flowers that go on forever with these sprinkler systems. And we're in the middle of a drought. And you watch the water run down these hills and down the street and flooding sidewalks. And it's everywhere you turn. Some of these lush, I, I'm talking lush, green, botanic gardens and it's like this trend in beverly hills now i understand when when we have water and we have rain it well, okay all right i get it not that big of a deal but right now you watch this waste that goes on and you watch this flooding and yet the water bills here are going through the roof there are, there are certain cities right now in Southern California, and I was listening to uh, some of this the other day, that the water bills have gone up 300%. 300%. And they are asking for, here in Southern California, for this water consumption. So the water consumption here in Southern California has gone down. Uh, uh, the latest measures are 27%. So our consumption, they've asked us to do that. So the water consumption has gone down. We've conserved 27% of water, right? But the water bills are going up 300%. There are some um, uh, cities here in Southern California that now are flush with money, savings, right now, because of the 300% increases in some of the cities here. And the water consumption has gone down. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Now, in addition to Polar, music mogul David Geffen was charged more than $30,000 in fines for using around 1.6 million gallons of water at his estate during a two-month period. 1.6 million gallons gallons of water wasted just so he can look good and i'm telling you the trend right now in beverly hills is to sit around and brag about how much you've been fined i'm angry turn your stuff into gravel unbelievable but i gotta pay for it i can't afford it david geffen can there's a big difference here. Getting screwed. Thank you, Carmen Bolter. Absolutely amazing. Cassandra, good phone call. This is Fade to Black. Executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Shows produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee. 
Mark Dunbar, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Drew, you've done an amazing job. Go check out our website right now, www.jimmychurchradio.com. Check it out. We're very proud. Music, this guy. Doug Aldrich. Intro is Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication, KGRA, the planet. Thank you to everyone that has called in this week. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Carmen Bolter. What an amazing show. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2016 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, or copied or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.